the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. I want to remind you that this public hearing is being recorded and broadcast live on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, and Files 964, and streamlined on www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Please silence your cell phones and other devices. That means me also. We will also take public testimony and would like to appreciate if you sign in over here. If you want to testify in person, there is also an option to testify by Zoom. If you email Juan.Lopez at Boston.gov with your full name for the Zoom link. At this, um, today's hearing is on docket 1293. This matter is sponsored by the mayor and was referred to the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation on August 9th, 2023. And for the record, docket 1293 communication was received from the city clerk of the filing of the Boston Planning and Development Agency regarding inclusionary zoning changes to the Boston Zoning Code. I'm joined by colleagues Flynn and Murphy, and I believe, and Councilor Braden, and I believe Councilor Anderson is someplace. Um, does anybody have an opening statement now? Would anybody like to start with an opening statement? Uh, actually, Council, Council Flynn was first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your important leadership, Councilor Baker, on so many issues impacting the economy of Boston. Boston's fortunate to have a strong ethical leader such as yourself. <clears throat> it's good to be with the panel. Thank you to the panel, to the administration team that is here for the important work that you are doing in our city. What I was hoping to do and learn about is what this proposal is, how it will especially impact ongoing construction, new construction, how high the IDP could possibly be increased to, but have, but also have you heard any comments from the business community that this might be a little too far at this time? Is it possible to, to reduce the number that you proposed to ensure that our economy gets back on track, that our development gets back on track? Um, pause it for a while, and then when the economy is doing well again, when development is doing well again, um, increase it. That's what I would like to learn. That's what I'd like to understand as we continue this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge Councilor Coletta and also Councilor Durkin. Councilor Coletta, I believe you were here next. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your work day in and day out. Um, I am uh, really excited for this hearing. Uh, my district, District 1, is seeing exponential growth. Um, people are being priced out. They are rent burdened. Uh, home ownership feels like it's far away for, for most people. And so um, this is really a, a lever that we have to negotiate with our um, private partners to, to provide affordable housing in the city. It's an extremely powerful tool. And modernizing it in this way, I think, is really, really important. And the levels in which um, you all have, have proposed, or the levels that you have proposed, I think are, are a good start. I look forward to the conversation and, and diving into the details a little bit more um, and understanding how this will positively impact the people of Boston. Thank you. Councilor Jerkin, opening statements. Thank you so much, Chair Baker. I want to thank the administration um, for their pursuing this matter. We hear from it, our constituents and witnesses and ourselves. Boston is in a severe housing crisis. Boston is a great city with a lot of history and amenities, which creates an understandably large demand for housing. And I believe what is being discussed at today's hearing are steps to provide all people from all income levels the opportunity to call Boston their home. It should be noted that this is just one of the tools in the toolbox that we can draw from to find solutions. 
and I don't expect it to be a silver bullet for our housing crisis. Um, I'm just um, the first. I'm in the first two months of in office and already taken very many meetings with proponents of all these projects that District 8 um, is encountering. Um, this zoning amendment will make sure that when developers step up to the plate, they are offering a proposal that satisfies the dire need, need for not just housing, but affordable housing. I think as the memo states, this change was crafted carefully through conversations with industry leaders and a lot of community feedback. So look forward to hearing um, from the administration and um, about uh, and today's panelists to understand deeper what these conversations were and what came, how this came to be. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Durkin. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the administration folks for being here today. I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, I really um, think that we need to use every tool in the toolbox to make our housing more affordable for our working families and residents of Boston. Um, I think our particular neighbourhood, we have seen a lot of development over the years, the last 10 years. Actually, one of the reasons I'm sitting in this chair is the cost, the, the housing issues. Uh, we were seeing a lot of development in Alston Brighton uh, that uh, the affordable units were coming in at 70% of the area median income and most people in Alston Brighton don't earn 70% of the area median, median income, so they were being excluded. Uh, from benefiting from the so-called uh, inclusionary development policy. I'm delighted to see that we're offering a broader range of I, um, IDP, AMI uh, 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 eligibility. Uh, I'm also very pleased to see that uh, we are considering, you know, the affordable, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing ordinance that we put in a few years ago means, makes it explicit that developers cannot just uh, ignore the fact that we need to build family housing that's affordable for our communities across the city. So I really look forward to the conversation today and thank you for all your work. I know this is really tough. Uh, we're in a challenging economic time right now, but we haven't been for the last 10 years. We missed a big opportunity because we weren't more aggressive, aggressive 10 years ago. And I'm hoping that we can find a way forward to build more uh, affordable housing for our uh, communities across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much to the uh, administration, uh, Chief Jemison, Chief Dillon, and Ms. Chambers. Uh, thank you for being here and your work. I uh, just want to get right to the conversation, the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Thank you for being here. We can't do our work here on the council if administration doesn't show up to give us the answers and, and we're allowed to have this platform to ask questions. Um, as of now, it looks like I'm the only at-large counselor here at this meeting, so um, I do appreciate that the district councilors really get in the weeds when it comes to development and neighbors and issues. Um, but I, I'm at like the Plan East Boston meetings, the Plan Charlestown, Plan Mattapan was at a meeting last night with Plan Downtown. So we're absolutely in a housing crisis. We need to build more housing, but then we have neighbors who are feeling like they're not part of that conversation and they want to um, make sure their voices are heard. So um, I'm hoping that from this meeting um, and we continue to communicate because I don't wanna always just be pushing back and pushing against the plans that I know you're working hard to push forward to make sure there's more housing across the city, but I also wanna make sure that the residents do feel like their concerns are being heard and that their, um, you know, th those ideas, and some of them are pretty good ideas, are being incorporated in the policy when we go forward. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Um, so there was two, two letters from one from the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce in opposition, and one from NAOP, Commercial Real Estate Development Associations of Massachusetts, in opposition. Uh, and, and I just want to read the last paragraph in the, the chambers. These will be on, will be on record. Um, this is from Jim Rooney. The zoning amendment does not address the feasibility concerns raised by the chamber. And in some ways, this amendment doubles down on standards that will dis disincentivize investment in housing production. Data indicates that building permits in the Boston metro area are down, down by 50% from last year. The chamber urges the council to reject this proposed zoning amendment and instead pursue policies with clear goals that will make building more 
building more housing easier in Boston. Um, and with that, with that, I'd like to turn it over. Arthur, you have some opening statements, and then we'll go to our um, presentation. Sure. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the chair and to all members uh, present today. Um, my name is Arthur Jamison. I'm the chief plan of planning and the uh, director of the BPDA. Just got a few remarks, and then I'd like to invite um, my colleagues here, Sheila Dillon, uh, the chief of housing, uh, and uh, one of my team members, uh, Amy Chambers, our director of planning, uh, to offer some comments in, in, in presentation. Um, we're bringing to you today our recommendations for the inclusionary development policy known as IDP. Uh, under IDP, developers of market rate residential developments are required to support the creation of affordable housing in exchange for, uh, in this case, zoning relief. Um, under IDP, developments with 10 or more units in need of zoning relief support uh, the creation of income-restricted housing um, through on-site units, off-site units, or through payment into an IDP fund managed by the Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, the IDP requirements were last updated in December 2015. Um, and in January of 21, um, Massachusetts State Legislature acted to approve a home rule petition allowing us to codify inclusionary development into our zoning code. Uh, the Mayor's proposed changes are aimed at directing a larger share of resources from the development um, that, that we're all seeing happen in our, in our city uh, towards a vision uh, of a Boston for all of our citizens. Um, these changes will enable us to support the growing population, ensure there's a place for everyone here, uh, and the goal is to increase, obviously, um, the city's supply of affordable housing. I did want to offer two very specific comments uh, as I pass it on to Sheila. Um, we have a great dynamic on our team, I, I think, and so we ask questions of one another. One of the questions we asked was, what are developers currently proposing in their developments that are going to the BPDA board? The answer to that question is, in the six months leading up to our proposal of 17% IDP with 3% um, for small area rents applicable voucher holders, um, the average was 17%. So. The 17% that we are uh, increasing IDP to reflects the six-month average of housing proposals approved by the BPDA. Um, the second uh, approach that we took was uh, one that one to think a little bit about the interest rate environment that we're working in. Interest rates have gone up almost 4% uh, just in the last year uh, as part of the effort of the Federal Reserve Bank to fight inflation. Um, and in that context, uh, instead of immediately implementing um, the new IDP policy, um, the, Sheila and I, myself, and other members of the team agreed that it would be important to create a period of time where we could observe the market direction. So this is going into effect not after this hearing or after the uh, layover period, uh, but at, at the end of October of 2024, which gives us time to absorb um, where the marketplace is headed. Um, so with that, uh, those two comments uh, offered um, uh, at the outset, I'd love to ask um, my colleague, Chief Dillon, to share some notes. Thank you, uh, Chief Jemison, and it's, I'm very, very happy to be here um, with uh, Chairman Baker and all, all the members of the City Council. I know that you have spent endless hours, days, uh, talking to constituents, talking to developers, talking to the person on the street about this very important policy. I know that I have. And we're before you, we come before you with our best thinking on how to change this policy, but at the same time preserve development that is very, very important to us in the city. So we thought it'd be helpful just to give a quick primer on uh, the, what has happened to this policy since its inception, uh, what, what the policy is now, and then uh, my colleague is going to walk through uh, with the proposed changes. Sheila, can I ask a question? So are you going to give us what it was before it was updated in, on, on 15, what happened in 15, and then what's going on now? That is correct. Okay, and if we you. don't provide you what you need, please feel free to ask. So, just, I think it's um, important, sorry, I'm, my glasses aren't working properly, but I think it's really important to uh, just take a pause and really recognize how successful Boston's IDP policy has been. 
developers have created over 4,000 on-site and off-site uh, restricted housing units that has not cost the City of Boston uh, any resource. We have 718 units that are in construction now, IDP units that are in construction. In addition, through uh, payouts, <coughs> developers have made over $210 million in IDP contributions, and that has allowed us to create an additional 3,300 income-restricted units. So it's just, uh, it's just an, been an amazing policy, and that's why we're, we're really we really want to get any changes right to make sure that, that the policy stays strong. Just a quick view, review of the timeline. Uh, the policy is, for Boston, it's relatively uh, not a very, very old policy. In 2000, Mayor Menino uh, created the first IDP by, through executive order. And then there were updates to this policy in 03, 05, 06, and 07. So it was updated fairly frequently. In 2015, the current policy was established. And probably 2015, we saw some of the most um, significant changes to the policy. It has not been updated since 2015, and I think that's, I think that's really um, something that we should all, you know, really understand. It's it, the update is long overdue. In 2019, the City Council passed the Home Rule petition, a Home Rule petition that would allow inclusionary housing and zoning. That Home Rule petition went to the state, and in 2021, the state legislature passed the our Home Rule petition adopted as Chapter 365 of the Acts of 2020. And this allowed us to put IDP and uh, linkage into our zoning. To take I mean it would be part of the, 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 the process of getting approvals, codified into language in the zoning. That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. Um, and then um, to really kick off and really look at the policy very critically, we commissioned in 2022 a feasibility study we formed an IDP advisory made up of developers, nonprofits, renters, and housing advocates. Um, we, we, we did our best thinking on this. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, input, and we put for, out for public review and comment an updated uh, IDP policy. We held three public hearings um, with the BPDA on January 21st, January 26th, and May 30th. And in 2023, the BPDA board recommended approval of the zoning amendment, text amendment. So there's been a lot of process in this over several years. Just uh, to help us remember uh, exactly what the, uh, the, po the current policy is in states, it's easy, it's best to do that and then look at what the proposed changes are. Um, it currently applies to projects with over 10 or more units and is triggered when projects seek zoning relief. In 2015, uh, the revision created three zones to set different buyouts and offsite requirements for different parts of the city because these, these at that time, they had very different economic conditions. And then this last slide that I'm uh, going to go over is really an overview, a summary of, of the existing policy. Uh, if developers are going to meet their obligation on site, they have to provide 13% of the total units as IDP units and income restricted. If they're, pre if they're going to meet their obligation uh, by creating off-site units, uh, the obligation is 18% in Zone A, 18% in Zone B, and 15% in Zone C. The cash out for rental, you can see it does vary by zone. 380 a unit in zone A, 300 a unit in zone B, and 200,000 in zone C. And the cash out uh, for condominiums is we looked at the price differential uh, between the sales prices and the market rate sales prices uh, and took 50% of the differential. So 50% um, so off the so if you, if you figured a condo was 300 and they're getting 550, so you only take the 125 off for? That is correct. Okay. That, the, the example I use typically is if we're selling a condominium for 200,000 and the market rate, the average market rate units in that building is a million, which is probably more, more like it. Um, I live in Dorchester too, we're, though. <laughs> we're, so. dividing, we're dividing 800,000. Yeah, right. thank you. Right. 
So that's, that's my summary of what is in the process that has brought us here to date. And I'm going to hand this over now, and you can hear about the proposed inclusionary zoning. Thank you, Chair Baker, um, members of the council. Uh, again, my name is Amy Chambers. I'm the director of planning for the BPTA. I'm going to walk you through our proposed uh, zoning, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So with regard to the changes that we are proposing to make, um, as you know, as, oh, Yes, oh, excuse me. Um, you have a question, uh, council? Please, uh, do we have copies of this? Oh, yeah. You good? Please, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Welcome, with, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so with regard to the changes we are proposing to make um, and to codify into our zoning code, um, first and foremost, we are looking to uh, change the uh, threshold for participation in this policy from 10 units to seven units. Uh, seven units is the number that was selected um, on the basis of the study uh, that was mentioned by Chief Dillon, uh, which indicated that uh, at six or fewer units, um, the impact to develop uh, to projects um, is much more significant. Um, so we chose uh, the seven unit threshold um, and would, would like to proceed in, in such a way. Um, this policy would apply to units, uh, developments with units of seven or more uh, whether or not um, that project was seeking, a uh, seeking exception from the uh, zoning code. So right now, if a project is seeking exception through the ZBA, um, they would be triggered uh, to participate in inclusionary development. Um, this would make it such that um, the only threshold is the number of units in the project. And, and then also, if zoning does change where you need less requirements, this would be in place. That That's correct. Right. So as we seek to uh, perhaps Rezone. provide opportunity for pro policy, uh, projects to be more in conformance with the code and therefore require less uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, this would create a scenario whereby those projects would yeah, still be subject. It's an automatic trigger we don't need to go in front of zoning. Correct. Um, we are not, a, uh, we are not uh, advocating to change the affordability period. It's currently uh, 50 years and we're looking to maintain it at 50 years. Um, and we have proposed that um, we would allow developers to satisfy the obligations uh, with relationship to this policy itself, either on the basis of number of units put into um, the development or on the basis of total square footage of the development. So under the current policy, um, developers are creating units that are proportional in size and bedroom type to the development itself. Um, and we were seeing a lot of, or are seeing a lot of inclusionary units that are uh, much smaller in size, studios or one bedrooms. Um, in order to address that and address concerns that have been raised around creating larger size units for families, um, we have created this scenario whereby a developer could meet the obligation through square footage instead, um, thereby allowing for opportunities for uh, units with larger bedrooms. Um, we would still require that units are indistinguishable um, in terms of finish, and if they are developed off-site, that they are substantially similar to the uh, uh, proposed project itself. Um, and as uh, Chief Jemison mentioned, um, we are proposing to have the policy go into effect um, October 2024. So we've made some recommendations um, on the basis of project size uh, to name um, how uh, the inclusionary development policy would play out. Um, with regard to small projects as per Article 80 um, or, or projects that perhaps don't qualify for Article 80 um, but still have seven or more units, that's, that's what we would refer to as IDP only developments. Um, we are proposing that 17% of units or 17% of the total square footage of the development uh, be uh, inclusionary uh, units and that that would be available to uh, tenants with an average of 60% of the area median income, um, not to exceed 70% of the area median income. So our goal is to develop an average of 60% of those residents, or 60% AMI for those residents, um, but not to have uh, folks qualify who are beyond 70% of so the area median income. So you will no income. longer get credit for 80, 90% units in, in this just scenario. 60 or 70. That's correct. In this. Okay. That's correct. 
Um, with these uh, size developments, we are proposing to not allow off-site development. So um, we would have developers make these changes on-site specifically. Um, we would allow, uh, uh, with approval, um, the opportunity for developers to um, make a contribution into the Inclusionary Development Fund in lieu of the units themselves. And um, where a developer has, where the average number of units that need to be developed uh, equates to a fraction, um, we've created a scenario whereby a developer can either uh, round up and provide an additional unit or um, pay out on the basis of, of what you see on the screen, and that is still divided by zone. So that would be uh, $675 uh, per square foot in zone A, $460 per square foot in zone B, and $365 in zone C. Uh, likewise, for our rental requirements for large projects uh, and PDAs, um, we have set up a scenario where there are two options that a developer could take advantage of. Um, one being 15% of units or, squ or total square footage uh, at an average of 50% of the AMI, not to, to max out at 60% of AMI. In addition, we would allow for 3% of, of said units uh, or square footage to be available to voucher holders, so a much lower area median income, for a total of 18% of units or square footage in the development overall. Um, we have an option B, which is uh, more units, um, and that would be uh, more units required at a slightly higher AMI, so 17% of units available to residents six, at 60% of AMI, maxing out at 70 with the 3% available for voucher holders for a total of 20% of units or square footage within the development. In this scenario, we would allow off-site development. Um, we would allow for rental units at 20% of units or square footage at an average of 60% AMI, not to exceed 70%. Um, again, the full unit contribution and the partial unit contribution are available. Um, we've provided a, an example, essentially, of a 100-unit development um, just to uh, begin to illustrate how these changes may take place. With our current policy, um, we would allow a developer to rent to an uh, average of 70% AMI. Um, in this example, 13% uh, of units, meaning 13 units, uh, would go to individuals at that AMI. With these proposed uh, options, under option A, we can satisfy a much deeper subsidy um, in terms of uh, individuals accessing the units for a larger number of units, 18. Um, or with option B, uh, we would provide 20% uh, of units, and you can see that that would break uh, down across a wider spread of incomes. We've provided uh, for separate requirements for home ownership developments. Um, so home ownership developments that are, again, small project or IDP only uh, would be able to take advantage of on-site development at 17%. Um, and here, with the home ownership units, we're looking at a slightly higher area median income, an average, um, excuse me, half of the units at uh, maxing out at 80% of the AMI, and half of the units maxing out at 100% of the AMI. So this is one of the uh, big changes, actually, that we made um, in anticipation of our board meeting, where previously we were requiring an average of 80% of the area median income, not to exceed 100%. Um, instead, uh, we wanted to provide opportunity where if the numbers can work, someone can uh, make sure that they're able to service someone at a lower AMI. Um, so we changed the language to reflect half at 80% and half at 100. We would not allow offsite uh, development here. Um, we would allow for full unit contribution at 20%, um, and we do allow for the partial unit contribution. For homeownership uh, large projects, we would require 20% of units or square total square footage of the development at the same AMI that I mentioned previously, half at 80% and half up to 100%. We would allow for off-site development, uh, here 20% of units or square footage. Um, that off-site development could be rental or homeownership. 
Um, so if it were rental, we would uh, require a, an average of 60% of the area median income and not to exceed 70%. And uh, home ownership, again, half at 80% and half at 100. Um, and again, we would allow for a full unit contribution or partial unit. I have uh, one more example just to illustrate how this might break down. Um, under our current policy, um, we will allow for 13%, uh, 13%, 13 uh, so 13 units within this condo development. Um, under the proposed, um, we are looking at averages of the same AMI groups, um, but uh, more units. Um, and that's it. I would be happy to take questions. Um, I'm going to formulate my thoughts. Who was first here? Um, Council Flynn, do you have questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel once again for being here. Can you, um, um, Chief Jamison, can you talk about why the number is being increased um, to, to that particular number and how you came to that decision that the IDP would be increased from one number to the next number. What, what was your thinking? Um, through the chair to um, council member at large, um, Quinn. Um, pardon me, council member Quinn. Um, the reason the prior rate was 13%. Um, and so what we did was we asked. Um, Sheila and her uh, mayor's office of housing to prepare an analysis of um, what the sensitivity uh, analysis would be to increase it. Um, and they came back with a series of recommendations. Um, and for um, and for their part, uh, they recommended a rate of approximately 17 percent. Um, now, in my capacity of working with Sheila on policy matters like this, I wanted to find out, well, what impact is this going to have on the proposals that come to the board. And so I asked uh, my team to put together an analysis to say, what was the, is 17% out of line with what we're receiving in terms of proposals uh, that are being approved at the board? Uh, and that, that rate was approximately 17% for the six months prior. Sometimes we get larger ones, other times we get slightly lower, but, um, but the average was 17%. So that was the original rate, and that's the rate we went to, and that's the reason why. There's one other note I would add, which is um, there's a 3% um, amount that's also added, um, so it's 17 plus 3. That 3% is meant to be fair market rents, um, for the city. So for someone who has a voucher that can basically pay a fair market rent, there also uh, is space held for them. Um, I should add that Boston has something called small area rents. So uh, one of the concerns that um, developers have shared with us is that um, we're concerned that if we're developing in a very strong market uh, with very high rents, that the uh, fair market rents that are set by HUD won't be high enough uh, we do have the ability to more narrowly tailor those rents to the high, even high-end markets that the city has, so that uh, those developers aren't losing um, aren't losing much, uh, if anything, on the rents that they're offering those people with the three uh, percent AMI. So, sorry, three percent um, voucher holders. So um, that's how we got from thirteen to seventeen, and there, that's what the other difference is between seventeen and twenty. So. During this period of time, Chief, did you talk to the development community, to the business community, to the banking professionals, asking them what impact going from 13 percent basically to 20 percent would have on construction, on financing, mm -hmm. on borrowing money, and is this a possible? Is it possible that a potential slowdown could take place because? this percentage is so high through the chair to uh, um, council when we did uh, i had a series of sessions with um naop um uoi uh, other organizations to talk about this um each of them said that 
they were concerned that increases in um, requirements for IDP might increase their costs and might make it uh, harder for them to develop. Uh, they also highlighted that um, if they did acknowledge that they were currently making proposals that were approximately the same as what we were asking to do, but that it was, it was maybe removing a little bit of the, um, you know, wiggle room, so to speak, that they might have, uh, even though they did acknowledge that the average is 17% or more. So one other note that they shared, which was, while the policy is having an impact, um, or would have an impact, um, they also said that what was having a much greater impact was the interest rate rises, mm -hmm. uh, and that of the things that were affecting their ability to move forward, the uh, lack of access to lower cost capital was their number one problem, and that among a range of others, um, they would see IDP going up as a, as a complication. Um, when we receive, when we get lower interest rates again, even by a little bit, um, I think we're going to start seeing people say, I can, uh, this is less of a problem, but uh, we definitely did the thing you asked. My final question, um, Chief, is instead of going from 13 basically to 20, are we able to go from 13 to, you know, 16 or 17, and then a development team that goes above the 17 percent, are we able to factor in some type of incentive for them? Um, I'm just concerned about that significant jump in IDP at this time mm -hmm. when we're coming out of a pandemic when we have economic challenges in this city, the downtown business community, workers are not back, including most of the city of Boston workers are still working two, three days a week. Um, would you consider going from 13 to 16 or 17 and then adding a incentive if a development team goes from 17 to 20? Um through the chair to Councilor Flynn. I guess I, I feel like our recommendation of 17% plus three is supported by the analysis that RKG supported and supported by the track record of developers themselves proposing 17% uh, IDP. Um, the 3%, as I mentioned, is really meant to effectively give developers 90 to 100 percent of what they would receive in a market from a market tenant through uh, the voucher program and through the small area uh, rent program. Um, I might add that the mayor recently shared in her speech to the um, Chamber of Commerce that she was considering incentives to cause already approved development to advance. Um, and so I think to the extent you're concerned about sending the right message to the development industry, I think we are similarly concerned and about the production uh, of already approved development. And so that's why an incentive is, is being considered right now. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Chief. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I had no further comments. I just wanted to get that on the record that developers across the city expressed to me that going from 13 to 20, in their opinion, is too high. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Councilor Raul, who has joined us, Councilor Lara, who has joined us, and I'll let you guys do opening statements. Councilor Coletta has something press, and we're going to let her go, and then you guys can do your opening statements. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Baker, and thank you so much for your work on this. It's very thorough. I appreciate the breakdown of um, rental requirements, small projects, large projects, home ownership. Um, I do want to just uh, give credit where credit is due. I was proud to work with the team that created the first home rule petition that is allowing us to have this conversation in partnership with you, Chief Dillon. Um, and so just want to give a shout out to Joe Wool as well as uh, then Council Lydia Edwards, now Senator Lydia Edwards. Um, so the existing situation in my district is that I'm hearing that the IDP uh, program has been successful and it definitely has created a lot of units and, and helped folks stay in the city. The situation in East Boston right now is that it's just not good enough. Um, we have seen, as I mentioned earlier, just an exponential growth of, of East Boston in particular, soon to be Charlestown, good night, Chief. 
Uh, and so I do feel like we need to, to modernize these tools to be able to adequately plan for the inclusion of people so that they could stay here. Home prices soared in East Boston, I think it was 224% since 2011. Uh, people I grew up with are no longer living there because they cannot afford to live there. Um, they cannot afford to buy a home. They cannot afford um, to rent there. And so I do agree with increasing this from 13 to at least 20. At least 20. And the 17% is consistent with what has been proposed by developers, at least in District 1. They have told us we can do 17%, no problem. And we have seen that developers can even do more than that. They can do 20%, as they did with Suffolk Downs, at AMI levels that are representative of the community. I think in East Boston, we're at 50 to 60% um, for AMIs. And so what I'm seeing here is a good representation of what is actually happening in communities. Um, I do understand that we have to be very thoughtful and balanced with having um, housing production, but we need to be super intentional about what we're putting in um, and what we're building for when it comes to affordable housing. So the, I, I am generally supportive of this. I just want to put that out there. I do think that we can go a little bit further, to be honest, because East Boston needs it. Um, I'm seeing a missed opportunity when it comes to the lower thresholds from 10 to 7 units. Chief, as you know, Chief Jameson, we are um, planning to increase the residential ceilings for maximum units from 3 to 6 in some areas of East Boston. This is going this way, this is going this way. It's two ships passing in the night. What I've seen over the last couple of years is that developers will change their behavior to not meet the minimums of affordability, and so they would be building nine units. And they would be building multiple nine unit buildings across East Boston, just uh, not meeting that the, uh, the threshold of what they were supposed to provide. And so I can imagine that they'll be producing six units, six units, six units, because that is what allowed um, through the Plan East Boston planning initiative, but they will not be required to produce any affordability from that. And so, you know, has there been talk of looking at this on a portfolio basis for folks who are building in Boston? Because that is what is going to happen. They're going to build six units because now they're allowed to do that, but there's no affordability requirement. And so I really feel like it's a missed opportunity for East Boston. So I don't know if there's any response to that. You have uh, the through, floor. So through the chair to Councilor Coletta, appreciate the question um, and appreciate the um, working relationship very much. Um, I'd also say that um, East Boston, Charlestown, each of them are different. Um, we, I think, together both saw the potential compatibility of the policy with our recommendation in East Boston. Um, I think we also both heard very, a, a lot of pushback about both the policy in one corner and then the actual upzoning being considered um, in the district. So there are some part, parts of the neighborhood which where that opportunity could be could have been joined. Um, I think we made a recommendation that it was meant to cover the whole city, um, and we're trying to make an East Boston specific recommendation in East Boston. Um, I, I guess I just want to say I acknowledge the point you're making. I think it's it's a it's a fair point, but I also think that the recommendation we're making for zoning in East Boston has been responsive to the local uh, tried to be responsive to local concerns. And also, um, so I, I guess I just have to acknowledge the point you're making and say, I hear you. I think we're making the right recommendation for the city. I think we're making the right recommendation for East Boston in this case. Through you, Chair, if I may uh, piggyback onto that, uh, Councillor Coletta, um, this is certainly not something that will um, address your uh, question in its entirety, but I do think it's important to name that in the draft zoning text, um, we have attempted to provide a more clear definition of uh, what a proposed project uh, may be. So where we have uh, developments that have, for example, six or less units, um, but where there are multiple parcels perhaps being proposed um, at the same time, depending on funding source or otherwise, um, some of those projects may in fact uh, be required to meet 
uh, these requirements. Um, we did that on purpose because we certainly acknowledge the fact that um, there is the chance that that happens. We know that was happening with the nine units uh, where 10 was required. And so where there are commonly financed projects, we may in fact not necessarily look at uh, developers work portfolio wide, but at, at least um, to look at uh, those projects as they're proposed and as they're coming before us to better understand if they are in fact connected to one another, that they may in fact trigger uh, the IDP. So you're saying if there are multiple projects that will now be considered as of right, there's going to be a way to review them and capture uh, at least an, an analysis of whether or not they're proposing on different parcels. But I would like to see something where, you know, there, there's one actor in particular where it's been 99999 everywhere, and he skirted around the affordability to the best of, of, his, of his abilities. And I just think that um, there, we're going to see a lot of six unit buildings pop up in East Boston, mm -hmm. and there's not going to be any affordability component that comes from that. And that's my fear. So just please continue to work on this. I know that there's, you're not going to be able to answer my questions or concerns now, but please let's just work on this if we can. Thank you. Would those parcels need to be adjacent, you think? I mean, because if you have different streets, they're different sure. projects. Um, we don't name that the parcels need to be adjacent. adjacent. What we've named in the text uh, is specifically with regard to um, a developer that has you know, common development that's perhaps being financed together. We've really taken a look at the financing mechanism as a way to uh, address whether a project really should be considered in its entirety um, or considered separately. So if someone in East Boston is proposing building four three-deckers, which would be 12 units. They're on different streets all together, but if they're financed by Needham, Needham Bank all together in one balloon loan, is what you're looking at? Uh, that's that's part, Something yeah, like that's that. yeah. what we're looking to consider. Okay, uh, we've also been joined by Council Louis Jean, and so I would like to give the opportunity to, to Council Worrell, to, if he has an opening statement. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank and you. we'll get into uh, questions after, so just an opening statement. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel for um, all your hard work on um, trying to increase in affordability uh, here in the city of Boston. I, I hear a lot in my uh, civics, you know, um, you know, when we are building, like, affordable for who? Um, so the AMIs is always a big question. And then also the inventory. Um, I have so many families in the neighborhood that want to stay in the neighborhood. So they're always looking for the two-plus bedrooms. And I believe the RKG report also pointed out um, the need for black and brown families to have uh, larger, you know, larger unit styles. Um, and then also um, the restrictive deeds, right? Um, I hear often from you know those who have who, who have bought um, affordable um, housing is that they don't get the same benefits right as as um, you know a regular homeowner um, whether it's you know taking the equity out to you know buy another home put the child through college um, or to open up a business um, because of those restrictive deeds they're not able to fully appreciate the benefits of of an appreciated market. Um, so those are some of the things I will, I will address in my line of questioning. Um, but then I also want to just bring into the conversation is, you know, local preference. Um, I know that, you know, through the creation of um, the affordable housing, we're trying to keep, you know, the families, you know, that are here, here. Um, so how do we, you know, make sure that we're being real attentional and using all of our policies and strategies and tools in order to do so? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council. Council Lara, your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much um, to all of you for all of your hard work. This is a project that has been very near and dear to my heart and that I've been really um, happy and uh, to steward through the housing committee, but also really excited about the outcome of it. I think that this is, is just, it's an incredible leap forward. So um, I wanted to, to say thank you. Uh, increasing affordability requirements that are going from 13 to 17 percent for rental projects, um, including the 3 percent for the voucher holders, I think is an incredibly creative way to really get the percentage of, but also give access to these families who have vouchers, give access to new units that they could possibly rent out. And as Councillor Worrell said, one of my biggest concerns has been the AMI and really bringing down the AMI to an average of 60%, which is actually the AMI for the people in the city of Boston when you look at it um, here in the city, I think um, is gonna have a really large um, 
spanning impact on affordability here in the city of Boston. I, through my line of questioning, will have questions about what we're going to see in the future and implementation. Um, and I'm also curious about the timeline, but I think for now, um, just expressing my, my gratitude in, in partnership for getting this done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor louis opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chair Baker, and I want to thank uh, the ministry, members of administration for being here for your dedicated work on this. Um, been able to, you know, touch base with you and community members and really uh, give suggestions, get updates, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the partnership that you've uh, engaged in to approach this work as an at-large city councilor. Uh, it, I go from neighborhood to neighborhood, from my neighborhood where I grew up in Mattapan to East Boston, as Councillor Coletta was stating, to Rosendale, all of these neighborhoods in which it's just out of touch for so many of our families. Uh, just coming right now from a meeting on affordable housing and how we can do more to both publicize the work that we're doing because we are doing good work um, and how we can do a better job of receiving community feedback. Um, we all know that third, uh, an IDP policy of 13% is a displacement policy. It is one that essentially ensures that families um, will be displaced by new development. And so increasing the IDP uh, percentage is important. Deepening the affordability is important. Um, and it's uh, also important that alongside, you know, that we not only depend on IDP as the only uh, as the only method to getting uh, to uh, our affordable housing goals. We know when we're, if we're talking about deeply affordable housing, the federal government has really abdicated its role. But I'm excited about what this can mean for all of our neighborhoods. I'm excited that this could also mean that we will see fewer people getting evicted and that we will uh, be able to keep people stable in their homes. Um, I am no longer working as an attorney actively in this space but the calls from people who are experiencing displacement and who are facing eviction are, are too many. Um, and while I don't think this is a perfect plan, it's not getting us to uh, exactly where we want to be, where advocates want us to be, I think it's a step in the right direction. Some of the questions that I have are questions that I have already put before you, um, so we will hear them right now in more of a public space, but they are about deepening the affordability. They are about how do we automate, if there is a way to automate reviews of what the proper percentage is. And it is important for us to look at, one of the reasons why that's important is it will let people who are developers and who are potential land speculators know about the affordability attachments that come to whatever property that they're interested in buying. It's a way of addressing that land speculation that exists. And so uh, I'm excited to get into the weeds of the questions. And thank you again to the administration for being here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. Thank you, Councillor. Is it you guys who are questioning still now? OK, so um, Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much, Chair Baker. Um, I wanted to dig in a little more um, to the macro level economic um, you know, that was sort of brought up in the feasibility study. And I know that, um, you know, that's the reason that you're moving the effective date of this proposal to October 1, 2024. Um, Chief Jemison and um, Chief Dillon uh, wanted to see if there's sort of thoughts you have on where you see the state of things going between now and then. You know, there's, there's uh, you know, a handful of variables in every real estate project and, and financial um, deal, and they, you know, they're always moving. And it is a little hard to predict a year from now, but we thought, as, as Chief uh, Jemison mentioned, there's enough volatility in the market right now that we feel like, based on the analysis that we did in 2002 and going bleeding into 2023, that these set of numbers make a whole lot of sense to us, and we've we've really you know reviewed them uh, at a very very deep and um, careful level. But we certainly do want to one two things. We want to watch the market uh, for the next year, uh, but maybe as importantly, we want to give developers time and uh, people that are selling properties uh, time to adjust their 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 projects. Um, there's no doubt that increased affordability requirements are going to, you know, change the economic viability of projects. So we thought really it, it was a good thing to give the, the industry time to really look at at um, how these would uh, these uh, requirements would impact, 
You know, I should say that um, there's there's a there's you know I was looking uh, over the. Um, the, a lot of the public comment in the last couple of days in preparation for this hearing, and there's been a lot of public comment and a lot of hearings, and really well-informed hearings. I will say the, the affordable housing advocates, the developers, the, the folks that are doing the financial analysis, they're all really understanding what's at stake here. And um, it's, no one is completely happy. Um, the, I think the advocates feel very much that we could have pushed this policy further and still uh, achieve feasibility. The developers feel that feasibility is going to be uh, uh, slightly harder, uh, especially given, given the uh, economic conditions right now. And we think, you know, sort of objectively, as objective as we can be, that we've struck the right balance. So I just wanted to say that, that you know, um, that lots of folks have been looking, not, all, not only the consultant, right? We hired a really good consultant who does this throughout the country, but we have had a lot of uh, our general public, our developers, other uh, development consultants really look at all of these numbers and assumptions and have really fed uh, our analysis. Thank you, Chief Dillon. And um, I, obviously, it sounds like um, we're gonna need to take this up in the next 60 days in order, because um, it's, is it being, is it, is, it if what? we don't hear this in Vermont, it becomes law in 60 days. Oh, got it, okay. Um, thank you. If you have more questions, we can come back to Oh, perfect, okay, thank you so much. Great. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we won't do it one round. If you want to come back, we'll come back. Uh, Councilor Braden. Um, Chair Baker, um, I, I think we have a proof of concept in Alston Brighton that we are regularly getting 17%, we are getting 20%, we're getting 25%. If a project is connected with a lab development, we're saying to the lab developer, where are your workers going to live? You need to create some housing, and they're creating housing for us with a significant level of affordability that exceeds, greatly exceeds the IDP policy. Um, uh, sadly, the IDP policy that we have had, the 13%, has been seen as a floor and not a ceiling. Uh, seen as a ceiling and not a, fl uh, a floor. Um, so you know, we've, we've, I'm really delighted to see that we're using the square footage um, uh, metric as a way to increase family size units. I, I see the reference to, you know, that the studios and one bedrooms were the way that developers were, were, were getting around that and avoiding illegally, like it's illegal to discriminate against families when you're building housing. And they would say to us straight out, say we don't, we're not intending to build family housing here. And then you wonder why our schools are emptying and our, and our, and our neighborhoods are decimated with families leaving. Because city workers, service workers, people working in healthcare, they can't afford to live in the city, and we have to change this. We have a crisis. I think this policy is measured and meets the moment. Um, I, my question is in terms of demystifying the voucher issue. We, we get to 17% and we'd say to a developer, we'd really like to get to that 20%. And they scratch their head and says, oh, you know, tell us more about these vouchers because I'm sick and tired of this sort of agnostic response that we get. I, I really want to nail this and make it clear that vouchers are an expected option and not something that's, that's negotiable. We want those three those three percent of vouchers. So I appreciate the the comment about the vouchers. One, they really do help feasibility. They will help the developers with feasibility, as uh, Chief Jemison mentioned. The BHA was the first housing authority in the country to use small area FMRs to allow our residents choice and where they where they wanted to live. So now the next step of this, and I'm very very excited about working with. Uh, fair market rent. Okay. Right. So it, it costs more to live in. You know, yeah. You know, okay. Um, so I'm, I was starting to say I'm very excited about working with Administrator Bach on this, and it has been very hard, uh, and studies have shown this for residents with a voucher to access new housing units, even IDP units. We know this to be true, and 
um, I don't have all the reasons for it, but we're going to start being very intentional. The IDP units are going to be um, advertised and posted where voucher holders can see them. Uh, the expectation from developers is going to be that they're going to accept uh, a voucher holder. Um, we're going to follow up and make sure that happens. So we really have got to start now working with voucher holders who want to move and want to live, live in a certain neighborhood, in a certain building. We've got to make those connections, and we've got a year to do it. So I'm really excited about this upcoming work. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a game changer, really. It adds, a, adds It's a no-cost option. for. The, we're not asking the, the, the landlord to take, you know, it's real money. And it's city money. It's it's coming from a solid, reliable space. Um, the other question I had was really um, the notion: like, uh, do we have a sense of, um, you know, affirmatively furthering fair housing is a very, very important piece of this. Um, and are we making what headway are we making on on having developers build more? Three, three bedroom plus units. Like we can sort of skim the two bedrooms are sort of almost a family size unit if it's a small family, but in reality, we need three and four bedrooms. What sort of movement are we making in that space? So um, AFFH uh, is a new policy, a uh, newer policy of the city, uh, and it's Part of uh, the way the policy is implemented, um, there's a process through which um, the, the policy requires the city to um, to request more um, of each development to try to get a larger uh, share of affordability than is uh, than the policy requires, and so um, that's one of the reasons that um, even though the policy today is 13 percent that we've had so many uh, developers propose 17%, and, and as we've worked on in, in Austin Brighton, uh, even higher, is because there's the compulsion from the law to ask for more. Um, but then there's also other uh, regulations which uh, call for the, uh, for BIFTIC, uh, it, which is an abbreviation for the group that uh, is, um, is brought together and convened by the Fair Housing Office to review um, uh, to review proposals, uh, that they make a, pr a proposal e for each uh, project that they adopt one or more uh, measures that are going to address the local AFFH process. Um, and so in each board memo that has a uh, affordable component in it, um, there is a, uh, a description of what was proposed and what uh, measure each development uh, interest has to accept, I believe, one measure. Um, which measure has been accepted and, and advanced. Um, we think this is a key part of the policy. Um, there is a, a interpretive question that we haven't quite yet answered uh, at the agency about whether with the increase in the IDP threshold, uh, if the same impetus to sort of request higher ratios of affordable housing through IDP is going to be carried forward, uh, but it is the reason we got to where we are, so I suspect that we are uh, going to, in our review, recommend something that continues to ask uh, for more uh, more support. Again, I think we're going to need to figure out how that fits into the new um, approval landscape, assuming it takes place. Did I answer the question directly enough, mm -hmm. Councillor? Yeah. The only thing I would add is that we know, um, and we've been looking at this pretty closely, that uh, Boston families are more rent burdened than uh, non-related households, and especially our families of color. And so it's, this is really a very, very important issue that we're building larger units and building income-restricted units. So um, I, I know that we all know this, but um, I am very excited that the mayor felt strongly that we do have the option here of units or square footage, and it is going to allow communities to have a voice as these projects get shaped. Mm -hmm. And you know, we may end up with a fewer number of units, but if we're really serving area families, then I, I think the trade-off is, is a good one. Yeah, thank you. Because we all know of families that are doubling up and tripling up in, in a three-bedroom. There's three families living in a three-bedroom. And, uh, and the other question I had was, uh, um, just the, the issue of permanent affordability, like in perpetuity, like you mentioned 50 years, is there, 
I don't know, like the expiring use experience, 50 years goes past really fast. Is there any way that we can extend the affordability of these units going out further than the 50 year level? So, um, to the best of my knowledge, um, we need a state permission on inclusionary development units, and those conversations have begun. So, I, at least on the rental, I, I will say that we are all thinking about and working and having some preliminary conversations with the state about how onerous that would be. On home ownership, um, as Council Worrell mentioned, we are looking uh, to shorten um, the affordability terms with ho our home ownership projects to allow uh, our existing homeowners to realize uh, after they've lived in the property for a goodly amount of time to, to be able to recognize profit and, and wealth creation. So there are, two, there are two different conditions, I think, really taking shape right now. Thank you. Mr. Chair, okay. I, um, I'm, I'll probably come back with some yeah, more questions. Yeah, we'll come back. Thank you. Um, Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, what is being done to get developers to apply um, for these vultures, um, I guess, and, and what can the city do to require this more um, in immediate future? It's a very good question. Um, the, the way that this is contemplated is that uh, households that have a voucher, either city or BHA administered, or any voucher, actually, um, but we really are excited about those that are paying small area FMRs, are going to be um, really have um, very good knowledge about where these units exist. And right now, they go on Metro list, the process is confusing, they're wondering if their voucher will be able to pay those rents. There's a lot of, there's, there's, we've got to make better connections. And developers will have the expectation that 3% of their units, if they're a larger project, uh, have to be filled with voucher holders. So it's going to be, um, I think, much better education with to those that have a voucher holder about where these units are, when they're going to be available, but, like that they are eligible, that you are eligible for these units, and lowering some of the barriers, high credit scores. Like there, there's been times where uh, we know developers haven't accepted vouchers. Are, is there confusion? Is it, there, is it a bias? But so all of that, we're going to say to voucher holders, you can access these units. They are available to you. And developers, the expectation is you need to make 3% of your units available to voucher holders. So um, there's a lot of work to do in this space. And um, I am assuming that um, Administrator Bach and I will be back before you to really work with the council to really try to figure out how we're letting our residents know of the opportunity. Um, thank you. And so if the city passes the new inclusionary zoning um, changes or requirements, can it push developers to go beyond those requirements uh, by applying to city vultures? So if um, I don't, I, I, I'm speaking right now for my colleagues or to my left and my right, but if a developer came in and um, said that they wanted to go above the 20%, say 25%, 30%, but they needed a project-based Section 8 contract for either federal vouchers or city vouchers. I'm assuming that um, that the BHA, the BPDA, and the Mayor's Office of Housing would welcome such a request and see if there's vouchers available, if we could make that request a reality. Um, it's, it's rare, but not unheard of, the developer will come in and want to go above, uh, above the, the existing affordability requirements. Um, thank you. The city's um, interagency fair housing development committee recommended that the developers of Dorchester Bay City Partners with BHA um, use project-based vouchers in order to mitigate displacement and make units accessible to households most at need. Um, do you see using city vouchers as a way that developers can affirmatively further fair housing um, and make new housing more mm -hmm. truly affordable? Through the chair to Councilor um, Fernandez Anderson. Um, so, if I recall correctly, the um, one of the stipulations of the uh, commitments made and it's represented in the board memo for Dorchester Bay City uh, from earlier this month was that they would work with Administrator Bach uh, and you try to use um, the 
um, specifically the the um, Faircloth unit rad vouchers. I know I'm using a lot of like shop talk here, but <laughs> um, but because the authority has um, uh, has a rental assistance benefit that's associated with public housing units that have been uh, turned into uh, choice or hope six projects, they have a number of um, rental assistance benefits that can turn into vouchers and then invest in projects. And they've agreed to investigate that with Administrator Bach as part of their project. I think if I'm wrong, not wrong, you're talking about city vouchers, which are a new program launched a few years back um, uh, in, in terms of using them for uh, for Dorchester Bay projects. I think that they're going kind to of look at those too, but I know uh, for certain that they've committed to use the administrator, the vouchers that Administrator Bach has available to her. Thank you. Um, in creating the new inclusionary zoning changes, the city created a Boston Housing Conditions and Real Estate Trends report. The report said that most um, BIPOC rental households make less than $31,000 to $37,000 a year. Are 50% and 60% AMI units affordable to those income? And I think, I mean, it absolutely sounds rhetorical, but really want to go on record and um, understanding these numbers for those um, watching. Um, and would city vouchers um, make units affordable at those incomes at some point? So um, the incomes, the AMIs, uh, both the 50% AMI and the 60% AMI uh, rent levels are higher, uh, th those rents are, mm -hmm. would be unaffordable to the, the families that you have identified. I'd have to go back and look at the indicators report, but I, I believe you are correct. We did reduce um, the AMIs, as, as you probably are aware, from 70% to 60%. And then after a lot of very rich conversations with the advocates and, and renters in the city, um, really felt like we, you know, we need to give another option if a developer in a community wanted to see even lower AMIs, and we went to 50% with a lower requirement. Um, to go down further than that, it would be very difficult. However, um, the, the way that the, the IDP policy is written, it would be a range. So we do expect that if a developer comes in with a 50% AMI average, that we will see units at 40% AMI, uh, 50, 60. So, the, sorry, the, the range uh, would include lower AMIs below 50 that would, would meet that population's need and the Section 8s. We will start to address some of the, some of the households that you've mentioned. I'm very interested, sorry, Chief. So thank you, I uh, appreciate your forbearance. Can I just add one a note through the chair to uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Um, very concerned about very low income households. Um, and the 3% um, that are voucher holders, most of those voucher holders are earning 30% AMI. So including it as part of, uh, in addition to the other 17%, is really a way of expressly prioritizing those households. Um, uh, the, the voucher holder yeah, is typically someone with a very low income, and that's and sort of that's one of the reasons why we wanted to include it in the policy. Thanks. At the three percent. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Is yeah. that yes? Thank you. Um, and I, this is uh, an area that's extremely important to me, as you know, um, considering the district that I represent. Um, average income being around $34,000, um, as well as um, typically, I mean, we know that the AMI is lower than 40% at that, at that rate. So um, I guess at some point, I would, I would love to um, work with you or be included in the conversations and workshopping that idea. I think this uh, conclusion or resolution that you've reached is exceptional. Um, to get to be, and congratulations and um, the entire team, um, to get to a formula that is extremely creative and thoughtful, um, considering the market, considering um, the dollar amounts to build um, nowadays. So I, uh, 
express my full respect for the work that you've achieved so far, but um, we'll continue with my questions, considering that, um, as some of our council colleagues have stated today, that we have so much more work to do to reach our goals. Um, it, is it accurate that undocumented residents are not eligible for full subsidies um, from Section 8 vouchers or federal funded public housing? I know the answer I wanted to go on record. Can undocumented residents um, applying for units with city vouchers? Can we, can we understand that a little better for those at home? I, I will do my best and then I'm going to verify with the housing authority and get back to you in short order. It is my understanding um, that undocumented individuals and families uh, can use city vouchers, can occupy tax credit projects, can occupy inclusionary development units. Uh, there is, there is uh, lots of regulation around federal mobile Section 8s and project-based Section 8 uh, contracts. And um, the, oftentimes what, what uh, becomes complicated for the administrators of these units is um, like that parents may be undocumented, but, but, but children can realize the rent relief. You know, I just realized that my colleague has worked at HUD. So why am I trying to answer this? I'm going to, I'm going to point to him. But, I, but if he cannot, then I will get back to you very, very soon. Sorry. Um, I, I would like to join Sheila in her effort to research the answer to this question. I, when I worked at HUD, I had the, available to me a series of national experts who could answer the question quickly. I don't have those uh, experts available to me today. So in that, uh, in that capacity, let's look at it together and answer the question. Thank you. Um, I'm not um, at all being facetious when I give you this response. Um, but for those at home, it's a prorated amount. And essentially, as uh, you both uh, are stating, you, the parent is not subsidized, the child is and per child per percent. So for example, you have two children and a mother, a single mother, then the two children are subsidized and that becomes, say that it, that's cut into certain percentage. Um, so the mother's percentage, that one third is whole. You have to pay full in full your portion and the child then or the two children are subsidized. And then you pay that percentage plus the, the full amount that the parent would pay in market rate. Um, so it's, it's kind of confusing, but they call it prorated, and it sucks. <laughs> I, um, just a, a little personal to connect with those at home. Um, so raising my children, I had to go to school. You, you have to pay out of pocket for school. Um, so I've mentioned that it, it took me about two decades to go to school. Um, so you pay that out of pocket. So you work, you save money, you pay that out of pocket, but you also, your rent is also not subsidized, so you're also paying this big rent um, when you're undocumented. It's better probably to go to, through BHA and not a federal <laughs> voucher, but um, I did want to discuss that because it impacts so many people in my district as well, and, you know, in all of Boston. Um, how many city vouchers are being actively funded now? Do we know that answer? Um, if not, through the chair, if we can get it. Um, how many could be funded with existing budget if more developers applied? Um, and if the budget increases in the future, how many more vouchers could be funded? It, um, I will get you, I have rough numbers, but I will get you the exact numbers and we can do that within. Can, do you mind if I do a follow up there? So, sure. That was the five million that we, we set aside a couple of years ago. Is that we, when we talk about city vouchers, that's the five million that this body approved. Yes. Was it APA money? No. Because it, it, it was the year be, it was 19 or 18, right? right? So um, we can't use ARPA money for vouchers because it's one time, so it, it is city operating. Yeah, well, that, yeah. that becomes the problem if, yeah. we, if we sign ourselves into, yes. you know, 30 million in vouchers, then what happens in a down right. economy? Because a voucher system isn't something that you can look at anyone's family and say, oh, your voucher just, we don't have the money now. So exactly. it's a, a kind of a slippery exactly. slope. But we w I will get you um, federal vouchers, city, city vouchers. And 
as, as you are all well aware, um, Administrator Bach has also fair cloth resources and is very excited about making them available to new developments. So, what was that? What was that? Uh, fair cloth. Fair cloth. It's a. It's a. It's. Um, it, it's a it's a way to pay rents uh, in new development. It almost acts like a project based voucher contract, and it's a, a resource that the BHA has because they have, uh, through some of the earlier redevelopments, lost units. So the federal government is a way to make up units that have been lost. So we'll get you all that information and, and do it quickly. Okay, and I'll disseminate that through the through the committee. So is it is our commitment still five million dollars a year for? city vouchers are we more than that or i think it is five million it may be slightly more but i want to get that for you too because it was um y you have you've increased it over two if not three years mm -hmm. yeah okay uh thank you the follow-up and then i'll yield my time thank you uh, so much yeah, for the back chair. thank you the only follow-up to that is um it, do we have numbers of the need in comparison, a, a ratio, if you will, um, to what we're actually providing and, I guess, subsidized by federal vouchers and then whatever, what gap we're feel, filling and how much more do we have to go? So we, we do indeed have, uh, based on um, very good research by both the BPDA and the Mayor's Office of Housing, how many you know uh, individuals and families are in income restricted units? How many uh, of our households are using a voucher? And how many households, especially our lower income households, are in market rate units and that are rent burdened? And those that number has is that's the number that I've always been the the most worried about. Um, and we have a breakdown by 30, you know, who's paying more than 30% and who's paying more than 50% of their, their income towards rent. And that's the number that probably keeps us all up at night. But I'll get you those as well. When we put together all the information, I can get you that number. More. And, and, and we, yes, we have to help our residents buy new, more homes. We have to, you know, take care of inequality. And we really have to watch that folks don't end up being displaced or leave Boston that are in that category. And I do believe this policy will help that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Councillor Worrell, questions? Yes. A um, couple questions. Um, one of my questions is, um, when it came to the housing, the home ownership side, um, I know we didn't um, state that we can use, and I'm just excited about this program, the yeah. Section 8 to Home Ownership Program that we have over at the BHA. Um, and also the new line item for you know city vouchers to be able to u be used mm -hmm. for home ownership opportunities, um, but on the IDP policy, I didn't see stated that mm -hmm. we can use um, home ownership of uh, the vouchers, or the vouchers will be designated for that three that three percent. Is that possible in in, the, in this IDP policy? Absolutely. Awesome. So we're just saying that the the developer has to create the the units. How the the family buys the unit um, can be achieved, you know, in multiple ways. And I fully expect that we'll continue to provide down payment assistance, good mortgage products. But you are raising a very interesting point. It, I think it is on us to start making better connections or new connections, right? Mm -hmm. um, of our families that want to buy, and, and you've been following the BHA's progress on this, it's pretty exciting, they have a voucher, and making sure that they're aware that these IDP units can be purchased. So I think we've got to, as we strengthen uh, the voucher holders to rent, we also have to strengthen the voucher holders to buy. So purchase, that, purchase, with, purchase it, yes. with the voucher, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. a, a rent, to, rent to buy option. Nope, they're, buying, they're just taking they're their buying. federal, how, their, their, voucher, their voucher, and they're using it to buy. So that goes towards a mortgage every year? Yes. Yeah. For 15 years, if the family has a disabled member, it's uh, for 30 years. Have we been able, have we converted on, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. It's, very, have, it's a very exciting program. Have we converted on any of those, any of those units in the city of Boston? Like, are we doing that program now? I think we have four closings yeah. already. In your happened. district? Um, I'm not sure if it's in my district, but... Are they newer buildings, IDP units, I'd, new buildings? I'd have to go back and check with the BHA. They're, they've got a whole, they've got a whole like, team working on this, but they have a very healthy pipeline of BHA residents, either voucher holders or BHA residents that want to and buy. And where are they directing them? So they're these new units. 
Right. Like, well, it could be new units or they could be just buying in the market. They could be leaving their their subsidized unit and buying, you know, so, single family and right. So if they get two thousand and a subsidy, that two thousand can go towards a mortgage. Yes. In, and, until the mortgage is done. That's correct. That is correct. It's uh it's using the fed it's using the federal money from the federal government to help people buy homes. It's actually brilliant and I wish we were I, I credit the BHA for really, you know, growing this program. It's it's a good one. Well home ownership is the way, Sheila. You need that stability because we talk about thirty years, thirty, fifty years, whatever, to have something affordable. Who wants to be in a, in a rented apartment for fifty years? You know, and, and, and do you pass that on generationally? I'm going to give it to my daughter now because she's going to stay under that income level. It's, it, it's, it's a it's sort of a catch-22. Sorry, Councilor, I cut you um, off. No, there. You no, continue with your, your No question. worries. I'm, I'm just as excited about the program <laughs> as you are. Um, and my, my other concern, though, is um, a lot of these new developments will be condos. Um, and the condo fees um, sometimes scares me, right? Um, the condo fees could be high based on, you know, the, the location of the development. Have we given any thought on how we make, you know, mm -hmm. the condo fees affordable um, to the, to the home yeah. buyer? So uh, I'll, I'll just kick it off and then any of my colleagues up here can answer too. But um, when, the, when we price a unit, well, there's two things. When we price a unit, we're taking like an, an affordable uh, condominium, we're pricing it, taking into uh, effect, taking into consideration the, the condo fee. And the BPDA uh, requires developers who are doing uh, inclusionary development units to base the condo fees not on square footage or amenities or any of that. They're basing it on value, right? So if you're buying something, if you're buying a condominium for two hundred and fifty thousand, your condo fee is going to be based on the value of of that affordable or income restricted condominium, not the not not the square footage because that they, those could be selling for a million dollars. Right. So it's it is baked in. So but but still our lower income residents do run into issues, especially if there's a special assessment. And we often help them fund special mm -hmm. assessments because it's something they just don't have the nest egg for. Awesome. And then my <clears throat> final question is, um, how, how is there, I guess, making sure that we get the word out to those um, who are looking to keep in the community, um, um, you know, making sure that this is a real anti displacement too. So like the marketing program, can you, can you speak to me about the marketing program that's going to be behind um, the units going forward. So all of the all of the units and the inclusionary development units are marketed um, by the developer, but they have to submit a marketing plan to us. Um, we're trying to we're trying to streamline the paper, but not the not the impact. <laughs> we're working really hard on that. Um, but so they have to they have to submit a marketing plan and show where they're uh, how they're doing their outreach where they're advertising. We also most most buyers and most renters looking for a unit in Boston go to MetroList, which is updated daily, and that is and we're also working with a lot of our um, housing counselors and nonprofit agencies that are helping uh, our households buy or rent. So we do have a, a we we really do spend weeks getting getting the word out. We are now um, we're d adopting or adding that we will have city staff from the mayor's office of housing go to a location close to the subject property and do info sessions and pass out applications, answer questions. Um, just it's yes, it's a lot of work for us, but we felt like it was just a really important thing to do as well. One thing that I used to do when I was in the real estate world, I used to send mailers about you know new to the market, um, and I know that's something that. Um, I've seen done in you know community engagement processes um, that the city has put on. So, um, is there? Is, I, I would love to like create like a standard marketing, like saying the developers have to, you mm -hmm. know, send out mailers to you know ten thousand people. That's on, you know, just trying to create like a standard marketing mm -hmm. list on things that they have to do, yeah. so that we're making sure that they're doing the outreach yeah. that's necessary. Yeah. I'd be glad to look in, into that with you. I mean, fair housing gets really, like, where are you mailing and who's excluded? So I, I need to explore it with you, but I'd be glad to set something up and really talk through with our fair housing folks. All right, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Harvard's gone. Councilor Louisiana. Sorry for the wait. No, it's Thank fine. you for your patience. That's fine. Um, 
I believe in participatory conversations, so I actually like that you were, and that's your chair, you can jump in and ask questions. But um, I want to thank the administration again for being here and for um, your work on here. It's, it's not easy trying to maximize the number of people who are happy and um, no one's going to like everything, but can you, can you get most people to like most things, right? Um, I wanted to point out, Council Oral mentioned something that I think is curious, and so I'm just going to start there, um, about home ownership specifically. You know, we have the 3% set aside, which is um, innovative, it's, it's, it's getting at the issue of uh, that ID, you know, can we tailor IDP for deeply low income folks? Um, and I think that's great, but we don't do that for home ownership. And I think that, like, I wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to ask this, but dovetailing off of his question, and so that people know that the 3% set aside is actually only for home ownership, right? Mm -hmm. The 3% for voucher holders, which I think is, again, is exceptional. Is there a reason why we didn't go, we have this new, the Section 8 program that we are advocating and everyone's excited about, kind of the chair almost jumped out of his seat <laughs> about it. Why did we not do the same approach for home ownership under IDP if we, are, if we want it to be a vehicle that, that Section 8 holders are able to use? I don't have a good answer. I think that the, the BHA really started to... Chief Mike. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, Chief Mike. Uh, do you want to do it? Uh, go. Oh. No, I was just going to... Sorry, pardon me. Through the chair to Council Lujan. I think there's a sequencing yeah. question. This policy... Um, what went through a long process of gestation, and so the um, I think with the introduction of new, new administrator Bach and the focus on this, there's been a kind of rapid movement. Um, so that's why I think that's the reason I think that there's a difference. But Sheila, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that was I was going to say the exact same thing. I think it was just the sequencing the the section a using section eight or city vouchers to buy is is a relatively newer push than the. These, these conversations about IDP. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Because th that to me then isn't preclusive of us potentially having a conversation about, okay, how do we potentially get small projects, I mean, you know, or how do we get either increase, get small projects up to, up to 20% or how do we build in to large, like is there a way to build in increases to large projects, IDP percentage for home ownership over time, right? If it's sequencing, then it's like in the future, it sounds like we can explore that. And more than explore, because exploring is always like, oh yeah, we'll look into it. Is there a way to build that exploratory process into what we have? I, I think it's, I think it's, the, the, the push to have our households use uh, Section 8 or some other voucher to buy is relatively new. So I would suggest that we, um, we see uh, whether or not, I mean, I think it's going to work. We've got a healthy pipeline. But I would give it some time before I'd make it a requirement in the home ownership component I, for this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm, just, I'm going to move on to my actual questions. Um, it, it still relates to the 3%. Those, we obviously see rampant discrimination when it comes, and I think Councillor Braden was making this point, maybe others, in the voucher holders in, as space. I'm wondering, and apologies if someone has already answered this question, what will be the attempts that are the, uh, the work done alongside uh, developers to combat that discrimination that voucher holders face? How are we going to um, um, oversee that 3% requirement? What are, like, have we built out what that's gonna look like to ensure that it actually is happening in practice? So, um, so, I mean, what's gonna happen is developers who are, who are developing something are going to say, I need to find, for me to satisfy my zoning, I need to have these voucher holders. Um, what's interesting about it is they, it's not as if they can say, um, I mean, the, the ability to be anonymous and not accept voucher holders changes when there's a requirement that they have voucher holders. 
So I think it's going to make our job of um, our job of making sure there's not discrimination associated a little bit easier because it, it becomes a requirement that you have uh, a voucher holder, a segment of voucher holders in your development. Um, but I think we're going to use all the normal means we do to prevent discrimination. But again, I think making it a part of what developers' commitment is is in itself uh, a way of fighting um, discrimination because they're going to be, you know, they're go they're going to have inspections, they're going to have compliance reviews that are going to say whether or not they're uh, in compliance. That's that comes with the vouchers. Um, it comes with the requirement. So. At least that's the way I, I'm seeing the enforcement. I, I might ask my colleague Sheila, who's might closer to this, to answer. No, this I, a I think better. that's right. It's a requirement, right? So it's no longer. And I think the, what the work that is left to be done <clears throat> or start is, if a developer came to us and said, "You know what? We can't find um, if they're doing a hundred unit building. We can't find three households that have a, a voucher that want to rent here." Mm -hmm then we're not doing our job, right? That we, we, we really need to figure out how we're making, as I mentioned earlier, how we're making it easier for voucher holders to know that those units are available to them and making the connections to develop from, from developers. This is a pool of people that are actually looking for an apartment. So I, I think that work has not been done yet, um, and, but it's gonna be ready by October of next year. So um, we're very committed to doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question about the home ownership AMIs. Um, it, I would love just to see deeper affordability. I, I just, I wouldn't, I would love to see deeper affordability on home ownership. I was just coming from a meeting uh, where a developer um, is developing in Roxbury affordable home ownership and doing it at 60%, 70% um, AMI. We're able to get folks in with $50,000 income, um, $50,000 salary a year. And so why can't we go deeper? Um, I know the answer. You're going to say feasibility, but like I want, I want to hear a little bit more about why we can't go deeper, um, especially because I think that there is some research out there um, that Maha has been involved in, in terms of like, we can, we can go deeper. Um, because it really changes the demographics, right? If we're being honest about who is applying depending on the AMI percentage when it comes to home ownership. And if we're trying to really make sure that our communities um, honor the people who've lived there for decades um, and who grew up there and are able to buy homes. And like there's permanency with how home ownership mm -hmm. and there's that sense of wealth building and being able, all of that, right? And so why aren't we going a bit deeper when it comes to home ownership? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not requiring or saying that we go all the way and the most bold here, but we're doing some innovative work around section eight um, vouchers when it comes to home ownership. We have city vouchers. Um, is there a possibility of using that to deepen the affordability on the home ownership level? Um, and I and I had another home ownership question that um, escaped me, but I guess uh, we can just we can just start from there. Oh yes, this is it. Um, the advocates had their own uh, consultant who offered uh, his own analysis in terms of what is feasible. Right, looking at the market, I think the different the differences between our consultant on the city and the advocates consultant was the the financial basis off of which they were calculating profit in, in terms of determining what's feasible. Um, and in that study it was, and I'm not sure, I don't remember if it was 25% for rental and home ownership, but um, just if, if you, if there's, if there's more to talk about on the public record regarding like why that report and that understanding is, is, is not one that we can um, conclude is, is, a, is feasible. So I guess it's two questions. One is on the home ownership and two is on the feasibility of another study from a consultant that we respect and believe, you know, does good work, who believes that we can go deeper. I, I'll, I'll certainly start this. Um, I, I do know that um, there are there are families out there that want to buy that are making less than 80% of AMI, and I know that groups like Maha and others are seeing those families graduate from their classes. So um, it's not lost on any of us that um, we really want to serve those families. 
we are serving those families right now with larger down payments and better mortgage products. In fact, I'll, I'll get to you. Um, I've I recently requested from staff just the, the range of incomes against AMIs on who's buying and who's in our programs. And it, um, I see them every day. You know, they, I have to sign off if we're giving them financial assistance and the incomes are, are low. Um, you are right. The reason that we um, hesitated um, putting low, having the prices lower is just the impact on home ownership projects. Our analysis showed that smaller home ownership projects, even with these affordability requirements, are tight. Um, and um, it, but it was very, it was very, especially on the outer neighborhoods. But it was very important to the advocates in the advocate community that we keep the the restrictions or, or the requirements the same throughout the city, right? Um, so the, the the numbers are very, the feasibility numbers are really really tight. And so we, the way we've been getting at serving a lower income population is large, much larger down payments. Um, and I think it is working, but I, I don't have numbers to share with you, but I can get those to you. I, I think based on the numbers and the analysis that we saw uh, to, to, um, to make the uh, sales prices even lower, serving a lower income population, would be very hard on developers, especially our smaller developers, who really, this is their bread and butter. They're building smaller condominium and, and townhomes across the city. And I think if we went deeper, uh, it, it really, at some point, it just becomes infeasible. So once again, we are looking at how do we allow development to go forward and at the same time increase the, the amount of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'd be glad to share the, the, the information on who we are serving now. Um, through the chair to Council Lujan. So I was present for the presentation of the other consultant uh, that advocates um, brought forward. You know, I appreciated their analysis. It's about, it's an analysis about what the return should be calculated on. And, you know, I think our, my view of it was um, advocates had been asking for the rates to be lower, for there to be other options, for there to be, I think that there's a, I'll have to have a recognition that um, these policies do have some impact on the volume and the appetite of developers to take on development projects. And um, the developers that we're talking about are not, they have a market business, they don't have, they're not affordable developers. And so trying to find a balance where um, we can get developers to continue to produce housing, which is a challenge we have already, and then saying to them, on the basis of this sort of relatively, I mean, a bit queer, but I think a person could easily disagree with their use of the, uh, their recommended metric. Was it cash on cash? Is that their That metric? was one of them, yeah. yeah. And, and um, could you just, are you, if you're able, could you describe to folks who are listening like the, what the difference in sort of that model is from the advocates? Um, Consultant Rick J Jacobus, right, and then and then this and then how we are calculating profit. I think that's just like an important framework well, for us. They're though. making an argument that the rate of return on cash um, versus the rate of return. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember what um, what metric it's on in the RKJ RKG study is <coughs> is they, that we should use this other analysis, and because of that, that makes it possible for developers to. Um, that makes it possible for developers to be able to afford to do 40% AMI units. Mm -hmm. I just. It's not gonna happen. I don't think that's feasible. And I, I think we're not in a, if we were talking about a different market environment, um, I might have a more, more sympathetic view to that. But we're talking about a very small margin and we're talking about um, a difference I, I think is not negligible, but is it's certainly within the, the, the sort of Policy making area, um, the the cost of borrowing, um, in, has gone from two percent to seven percent in a period of under a year. I'm saying to development interest, we want you to continue to develop in an environment where those policies, where that where that, where that other dynamic of their business has changed radically, seems to me to be. Um, it's, it's like we're talking about a, a small difference, mm -hmm. a small but material difference, and saying because of the small material difference, we're going to ask for a very significant 
increase in the amount that we're asking. I think, listen, it's, it's all about elasticity. I think you could impose a, high, a deeper subsidy policy. Um, I think it will actually have a depressive effect on the number of units that are produced and the appetite of developers to take on new projects. And I think if we're trying to produce units, if the outcome we're seeking is people moving into units, um, then I think you, you're going to have a you're going to have an impact that isn't isn't the desired impact. Um, so again, I, I think I certainly appreciate the advocates bringing forth that analysis. I thought it was really valuable. I think we had a really about largely um, a very valuable interaction with advocates. But I think that um, we had to make a judgment, and I think our judgment was recognizing that the analysis, the analysis does make a kind of sense that we still needed to have a balance where we're, re I mean, we're taking a policy that was at once targeted at middle income households for the city yeah. and we're turning it into an affordable housing policy. We're deepening the subsidy level, we're increasing the, um, the, uh, the demand for it through to create family sized units. We're um, adding um, a, a number of a percentage that helps us focus on very low income households. I think we can't have every policy meet every requirement. I thought we, we found a decent sense of equilibrium. If the market was stronger um, and interest rates were lower, we may have a different view. Thank you. Uh, through, uh, excuse me. Through you, Chair, um, on the question of home ownership, um, I realize this uh, doesn't necessarily answer the question fully, but um, I wanted to just acknowledge that where we have required in every other scenario um, an average AMI. Um, we purposefully removed the question of mm -hmm. the, the, or the requirement of the average AMI from the homeownership scenario. There were previous versions of this that were drafted that named 80% as the average required for homeownership. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we removed it and listed this as a half up to 80% and half up to 100% was uh, intentionally to mm -hmm. allow for additional opportunity yeah. where possible, where there are subsidies available, down payment assistance, et cetera, uh, to allow lower income families to be able to access homeownership units. Um, and so, Councillor, to the point um, that the policy presently doesn't necessarily uh, um, actively promote the requirement of lower income uh, families in the home ownership model, it doesn't preclude them from it either. Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. I think that's excellent. I also still think it requires us to think about how are we going to incentivize that, right? And like, does the data bear out that that's going to actually make a tangible difference? But I think that's excellent. So I, I appreciate you for, for bringing that up. I have two more questions, but I'm, I'm happy to wait for a second. Round. Yeah, let's come back okay. around. Thank you. Um, oh, but through the chair, can I ask that they uh, provide us with the financial analysis, like the, I know that was cash on cash for uh, Rick Jacobus's. Could you give us the same sure. financial metric for the city's analysis? What, so you. you want the analysis from the city side? Yeah, like and what, you what, already what have was, the advocate side? Yeah, we just, they, it's the cash on cash. But what was it, what did the uh, city's consultant I forget the name of the consultant, but what? RKG. RKG, what was their, like, what metric did they use? Uh -huh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. So IDP is what we're talking about here. That's basically um, residential, anything it was, anything over 10. Um, so if it's seven units, that means that seventh unit in Dorchester would be 17%. So you need to give 17% of that seventh unit. It's not a, not a full unit. Am I correct there? It would be 17% of the uh, in project overall. Um, and so in that scenario, you would be required to provide at least one unit. So there wouldn't be a scenario where you have uh, only a partial unit that- yeah. So basically, if you do a seven unit building, one unit is going, is going to the city, there's no percentage where, so if someone decides to cash out and not do the unit, they, they give the equivalent to the housing trust. Is that where IDP money gets handled? Yeah, that's correct. Um, yes. In the scenario where we're talking about a seven unit development, um, the uh, full unit contribution is something that would have to be negotiated, so it's not automatically allowed. Right. Um, that would be on a, uh, case by case basis um, in 
in working with the compliance team. Okay, so the developer would have to say, I would rather give a contribution to the housing trust than give this single unit. Yeah. What, one correction, I, I said yes too quickly. Um, inclusionary um, development buyouts are collected by Treasury and then uh, it's part of the budget and it's part of the, the, the authorization that we all go through. So it doesn't go to housing trusts. It doesn't goes go, in, no. It goes into general fund? That's correct. Yikes. Yeah. So so how do we know who's watching who's watching the hen house there, Sheila? Uh, Treasury. Okay. Treasury. And it all goes into, there's one account there for Treasury. We got this month for IDP. Oh, yes. And they report out at housing trust. Absolutely. We don't collect, BPDA doesn't collect, Treasury collects, and then. So how does that money get, how does that money get sent to where it can be most helpful? So uh, the money is, it's very clear, it's for the production and preservation of income restricted housing. Uh, we put out competitive RFPs. You, you, I've been receiving letters from many of you in the last couple of weeks on this round. Uh, we put it out through competitive funding rounds. To builders? To, to, yeah, to, to developers, yes. To, to build yes. affordable units, and it, and it doesn't go through housing trust? That is correct. Okay, the housing trust is the linkage money. That is the linkage money. And explain linkage for us just okay. for the... Sure. So... so um, IDP, residential, residential, what we're talking about now, linkage, commercial. Right. And, and I think it's a good point because we are, you know, I think as an administration, we're trying to be very careful and looking at each uh, individual economic system, uh, you know, carefully. Anyways, um, sometimes you'll hear, to, you know, others say, you know, IDP, linkage is too much, but it's like, you're right, linkage is for commercial buildings. So uh, buildings uh, over a certain square footage, if you're a commercial building, lab, you know, office building, um, some of the commercial properties on our um, institution, institutional campuses, they pay a certain amount per square foot uh, that is used for the creation and preservation of affordable housing. Over 100,000. So, so to, be, to buy into it, it needs to be at least over 100,000, so they'll, they'll pay anything over that first 100,000. Did that come down to 50,000? It did come down to 50,000. Came to 50,000. Yes, it did come down to 50,000. And when it was, a, so we changed that from 100 to 50. Was that in was that in nineteen? We changed that. Do you remember, Sheila? That was. All right, let's not. Let's yeah, not so I'll, I'll get that out. for it you. It was. It was. was I think was ten recent. and two, ten for housing and two for job training. That's right. Yeah. What is it now? Um, I'm going to get that for you, so I don't misspeak. I, I sort of was in an IDP. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> I, I think it's around fifteen yeah. and four. It was increased. It, we increased the commercial uh, rate by fifty percent. Also, there was also a phase in because the BPDA thought that was prudent, as we all did. Yeah. And then uh, Lab has a slightly higher buyout. Yeah, and but those we'll, are those. That's the Lab is a pretty new development. That is correct. Okay. And then mitigation is something else, which is. A lot of times, uh, uh, public realm improvement, and with that, can you talk about mitigation a little bit, Arthur? And these are the three buckets of what a developer might have to be yes. uh, on the hook for. So, um, usually to mitigate impacts of um, development, um, pro proponents, uh, developers, will propose to invest in a series of things. They might invest in uh, there need to be new traffic signals at the intersection. There needs to be a, a re. Um, there needs to be a change in the traffic signalization uh, in the area. There needs to be new street lights, sidewalks, open spaces, um, public realm improvements uh, is the general category. Um, but often uh, they might mitigate an impact by adding more affordable housing, yeah. or they might mitigate an impact by um, creating affordable commercial space. Wide range of things, um, but typically. Um, develops, developers will propose that part as part of Article 80, and then um, and then uh, pay pay for the execution of it uh, out of their end of the development, uh, but deliver it at the time that the project's delivered. And there's no sort of language that directs us on that mitigation. It's kind of project by project. They need a sidewalk here. They need this here. There's no real. Yes, and in fact, um, through the, to the chair, I would say one of our efforts um, that we had been working on a lot lately is um, uh, is an Article 80 modernization plan, so that it's easier. Because what ends up happening is it ends up being a, cre a lot more of a creative process for both citizens and developers. There's kind of a there can be either an expectation um, mismatch or like expectations that are not 
um, sort of managed well. So what will happen is developers might say, well, the economic impact of what I'm doing, I'm doing 20% here and I'm taking these other actions, and then there might be a demand for more, and the developer says, I, I can't really do more. Other times, um, people might, there might be a disagreement about what is the most important thing for a particular neighborhood. Um, and so trying to create a set of expectations, like these are the three ways that mitigation money can, or mitigation investment can happen. Mm -hmm. um, th this is the percentage of your project costs that you should expect to invest into mitigation. Um, these are the, because often developers will, and community members will say, developers will say, I paid all this money into this mitigation activity, and citizens will say, I don't see any of the mitigation that I negotiated for, and it's like, well, that has to happen in a specific sequence at a specific time, and oh, we have BTs, DDs doing that. It's like, so by the time it happens, everybody's forgotten about it, right? Or um, forgotten about it, or might even think it wasn't adequate. So, it's one of those things that we're working hard on is modernizing that system because I think it'd be better for citizens and developers to have an expectation going in of how much, uh, for them to have a. Uh, understanding of how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen and sort of limits on those things. Yeah, and, and my opinion on this as a whole is what I think is going to happen is that smaller developer, that person that's been in the neighborhood for years that has delivered units for, for less money for however many years because they know people mm -hmm. and then they've started building those six, seven, ten unit buildings and they, they, those same behaviors are, are, are there. I think that's the person that we're going to totally crush, totally put out of business. Same when we start talking about uh, rent control and things like that. The bigger companies, they don't even care because they know there's money to be made here. So they say, okay, well, we'll spread this cost out over 1,000 or 2,000 units. It's the person that's in the neighborhood that for the last 20 years has been delivering this type of housing. And I know, I know many people, mm -hmm. East Boston, South Boston, Dorchester, they've had more calls in the last couple months, and not that we're talking about rent control, about people saying, you know, I'll get the call from the person that's renting first. My, my rent's going up X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. I call the landlord. The landlord says, this person's been with me for 20 years. I love them. I don't want them to leave, but I also don't want the city telling me what to do. And this feels a lot like um, the city implementing. Councilor Rorell said, and I share this, this, this sentiment, mm -hmm. how are we getting our people in those units. The people in Dorchester looking at the, looking at the nice buildings, that's all well and good. I'm never gonna get in there because you need a PhD in paperwork to be able to just get on the list. And, and at what point are we gonna really streamline those processes and, and Doc Block actually has a, a um, local preference for some of some of the units because our demographic where we live yep. it's a it's a very diverse very diverse areas how do we put that onto ster in steroids we want people to feel good about the buildings going up because they feel like they have a shot getting in them same with the with the with the labs people don't they're apathetic about them because they don't think there's a job in the lab and they don't think there's a house in, in these new big buildings that are coming up. So we spend a lot of time talking about 30% AMI. How are we going to pay for these people for the rest of their lives? Too, by the way. This is a commitment that it's for the rest of their lives. Look at the generations that remain in the housing developments that have been there for 50 years, passing it down to their kids. At what point are we going to start looking at the cliff effect and say, okay, let's stop this keeping people with that noose around their neck. How are we going to, is it federal law? Is it state law? So can't tell you the amount of people that will say, okay, I got into this unit. It's great. My kid's 18 now and he's going to go out and get a job. They told me if he gets a job, then everything goes up because the kid does what you're supposed to do when you're 18, go out and get a job. Those are some of the problems. Also, the family that calls that says, I got a decent job, I'm okay, I can pay about 1800 or two grand, but the rent is 2800 When are we gonna start dealing with that middle class family? It's high and low, and we all talk about, oh, it's high and low, there's no middle class, but we are doing nothing. All of this is all well and good, but we're not doing anything for the family Mom and dad both get up and work every day. They can pay some rent. They just can't pay 3200 for a three bedroom. That's where we have, so where are those vouchers that, that, that are gonna be open to that family that, that makes that money? I mean, I wouldn't be able to live here now. I wouldn't be able to, to buy, a pro buy property now. 
I was here and buying when everybody was leaving and, no, and people looked at my neighborhood that, that it wasn't a good neighborhood. Why would you want to live there? I wouldn't want to live anyplace else. But the reality is everybody wants to live in the city now and we're not doing anything for the, for the people that can, that can come here and they're actually getting up and they're going out and they're making our city work. But they're not going to be here much longer because the schools are going, the schools are having their issues. I don't want to badmouth anybody or anything. The schools are having their issues. And there's no way for us to help that family that wants to stay. That can pay a little bit. Um, I'm excited about the voucher system with that sort of rent to own thing. I think the devil's in the details with that. How do we end up, like, who's going to run these buildings? Who's going to lay out the, um, the, condo docks and the condo associations, who's gonna be responsible for those things? Um, because it's a whole different way of living, you know, when you, when you have that responsibility of a, of a condo uh, association and it's sort of communal living, you have your own space, but you have to respect the pe people along the way. I think those are the, 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 the um, things that we're really gonna need to help with and set up that sort of programming. I don't know if it's connecting de um, different CDCs along to own, to kind of own the land and the, or, or, or own the uh, condo associations to help people do those. Are there, is there anybody now, Sheila, building on city land or any other, any other kind of land that you know of, building home ownership opportunities? 100% um, home ownership opportunities with any of our, because the NHI program, I think, was one of the best programs that we did. We put a lot of people in housing, and, and um, the housing was single families and three families. Nobody's building those anymore. Great for those families that got a single family or a two family or whatever. But I think we need to stop looking at that, the same sort of mo model, the NHI, but building 25 units, building 40 units with the condo association <laughs> wrapped around them and help people hold their hand right till they're moving their bedroom, till they're moving their bed in. That's what, that's what we need to do. Um, I, I'm very concerned about the seven units here. I'd feel much more comfortable with this if it were still the ten units. Um, seven units, I think, is is a little low, especially places like where I live. And one of the councils had talked about all the development that's been going on for for ten years in Dorchester. We just we just got the development. I've been here for twelve years. My first two years, I might have had zoning two or three times. In that third year, in that fourth year, people are coming, they want to build. I have probably one substantial building, the, the, the dot block building, which is a couple hundred units they're looking to get into. Yeah. They don't even know if they're going to do their second phase because Dorchester being that risk area. So they had a, they had a, they had a bar set. They wanted to get to 60% occupancy within a year and a half or two years. In 60 days, they were above 60%. That's how many people want to live there. And we got over 5,000 applications for those, someone was calling them Frank Baker units. They were the units that were going to be available for people that lived within a mile of the, of the project. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about all the units we have and everything and until we're putting, and I'll use the term, and if I sign, so, sound Tribal, that's okay with me. We need to get our people in these units. Our people in these units and help that family that can pay a little bit. How are we talking to that family that's in that unit now that can come up with 1,500, 1,800, 2,000? Let me give you 1,500 a month so you can end up in one of these apartments. We also need to change the way we think about our home. It's no longer that single family with a picket fence. It's I remember hearing the Manhattanization of Boston going back 10 years. It's here. We have to figure out how we're living in apartments and the, the picket fence is gone. Um, can we talk a little bit about direct designation? And I know that's more linkage than, than IDP. If a developer, I've got some big developments happening in, in, in I mean, Dorchester Bay City might be a couple hundred million in linkage money for housing, same for, same for job training. Are those um, outfits able to direct designate and what would it take to be able to come up with a real program if, if people say, okay, I want to build this building on this lot of land, 
I want to build 100 units, and I want to use my money, instead of it going through city bureaucracy, nothing against city bureaucracy, I've been here for 30 plus years, love the city, but there is a bureaucracy there, and the developers would be able to spend their money more efficiently and build more units. Mm -hmm. Is there any talk of direct designation, and if not, how do we get to that? What, what, would, what would make, what would make um, you guys feel comfortable about direct designation, yep. especially if it's, if it's major dollars? Yep. So through the, through the chair, I'm going to ask my colleague Sheila. So Sheila, my understanding is that the method, uh, that the technical method for approval of a direct designation is the neighborhood housing trust. There's a, a request made to them yep. by a developer uh, to say, I would like to, I'm going to pay my obligation, I'd like to pay it to a specific project, and I'd like to, I think that as long as it's approved by the um, housing, trust. housing trust that it's okay. That that is mostly mostly correct. Um, he got and, an eighty percent on that. Yeah, you're you're very both very very close. <laughs> but um, so no, and we like direct designations yeah. because oftentimes a developer has been having conversations with the community, and the community is saying, okay, you want that lab, but we really would love this home ownership project to be built. Do we really want this senior project to be built? So we we like those. Um, they go to, um, they, it's called a housing creation. They do go to the BPDA board as well. So there's two stops. They go to the BPDA board, and the BPDA board says, we like that housing creation, and they do go to the trust. So, so it would basically be scheduling in front of the trust and scheduling okay. here, and then the developer's team would say, well, we've got $8 million in, in, in linkage, yep. and we'd like to put it the entire eight million directly towards yeah. this project right here. And, and typically they're saying we'll present value it and we'll make it available all at once. So I do know, and I, 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 my colleagues would know better than I, but the linkage money that is um, coming from Dorchester Bay City, because a lot of Dorchester Bay City is rental, yeah. um, they, uh, they, a lot of Maha and others were very interested in getting a lot of the linkage money to create home ownership opportunities yeah. in, the, in the area. So um, I, I, we can't speak for the trust, but we did, I think the board vote said that that would be broached or that would be raised yeah. to the trust. Yeah. So, so back on that, specific, because um, Maha's um, potentially going to get $10 million mm -hmm. to be able to help towards um, <clears throat> getting people in homes. That's right. And one of the criticisms, and in, in, I, I don't necessarily think it's a criticism, it, it is what it is, is a lot of that $10 million will probably go to places outside of the city because of the affordability, um, the affordability problem and the availability. So if... Oh. If Maha now has got whatever the grants are going to be, let's say they're fifty thousand dollars, and Sheila, you want to buy, you want to buy something, you want to live wherever you want to live. You can't find. I mean, the reality is you're probably not going to find very much in Dorchester, in mm -hmm. any place in the city. So now you've got to take your money someplace else. I don't think we're going to say to that person that is going to buy their first time home, no, you you can't go to Quincy and buy a home there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm almost certain uh, through the chair that that money uh, is to be spent in Boston. Um, so I, I, I think we should look at that because I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm, I think Arthur, I like you a lot, but I'm not in agreement <laughs> with this one. Yeah. So my quite my the thing is this. So what do we do? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it looked like Council Lujan may actually know the answer, so that's what I looked yeah. at her briefly. Yeah. I think it's statewide. Yeah, it's not. It, 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 mm. in, 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 again, I would never want to be the person saying to someone that's moving to Quincy, say, oh, that 50 grand that we're planning on giving you because you did everything we asked you, you can't do it now because you can't buy in the city. Yeah. But then you go and look around the city and you can't find anything. So question being, how do we tie all that together and, 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 and allow places to build units that, that will be specifically towards yep. something like that program. Home ownership units. Right. We, we are building, we are continuing to build home, affordable home ownership mm -hmm. uh, throughout the city. We have a very healthy pipeline. Um, and you know, on both our land and, and developers are coming forward with projects. So I can get you the list, it's pretty impressive. What has helped this effort is the state's Commonwealth Builder Program, not to get too, down, too in the weeds, but 
uh, in the past, the state was very hesitant about funding affordable home ownership, uh, and so we were we would foot the bill. And now we're splitting it with the state, and the states Why are very was the generous. State hesitant. They just thought that you know that their money was best spent on rental, and that were, was where the greatest need was, um, and that is no longer the case. They have a very robust program, and Boston gets a very sizable share of that resource. So it's making our money go further, um, and so we are we, our pipeline of homeownership projects is much better than it ever has been. Now, when you say approximately how many units? city-backed units of home ownership do we like in the ballpark do we have in the pipeline and what does that pipeline look like are they almost finished or yeah so um i don't uh we have we in the city as you, we have 2900 affordable deed restricted homes um i will get you what's in construction and the pipeline i don't so, have that so but that's I can give it to you. that's currently we have occupied 2900 deed restricted homes yes yes in um on the, on the deed restrictions so to yep. speak yep. to yep. council or else right um i can see the need for restricting it maybe first 10 years or whatever first 10 years you need to make sure that your your bottom line remains the same you don't want people going out and remortgaging and who knows what that looks like that's normally where people lose their homes when they try and play that game of refinancing and pulling money out so mm -hmm. what do you think do you have any ideas or thoughts yeah. of what that should look like? Because if someone is in the home after 30 years, you would think that they're, especially if it's their home and they own that home, mm -hmm. you would think their lot has changed and they, and they. Right. It's a, it's a very, very um, complicated problem and I see all sides on this one. For once in my life, I don't have a, a, a strident opinion. I think we do have to be concerned about families building wealth, and at the same time, we have to be concerned about having a resource that's available to, you know, for future generations. So what we have done recently is we have shortened the term of uh, the, our new deed restrictions. Um, for home ownership. For home ownership. We're making it much easier for um, homeowners to sell to family members without being income qualified. And if you want to sell to your son and and he's an electrical engineer and he's making like go ahead and sell it right? yeah. it's a family home um we're we're providing more return for um families and households that have done capital improvements we're saying yep you should be recognized for those and so it goes we've we've been having lots of conversations with um you know elected officials but really also uh, affordable housing advocates community leaders trying to figure out what what is the right compromise what's the right middle ground here um, so there's a lot more conversation to be had and more work to be done. We're looking at other cities. Some cities are, are have much longer terms than us because you know stability of neighborhoods was their their focus. Yeah. So it's like like IDP. It's finding the right balance that um, we can justify the investment and and promote neighborhood stability and at the same time not choke people off from yeah. recognizing uh, return. Um, you know we have looked at. Uh, we did some really good research and we're updating this and I'll, I'll get it over to you too. Like, at what is the appreciation per year on average? So believe it or not, the market has been increasing by about 5%, give or take, right? Over longer periods of time, right? Last three or four years, it's been nuts. But our affordable units are, have also been increasing by about 5%. So the, the, the rate of appreciation is about the same, but what's different is where you're starting from, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, if, if you're starting a 5% appreciation on something you bought for 600 versus 200, right, the, the yield is, is very different. So, but it is interesting to see that the appreciations are pretty similar and families have benefited from very stable low housing costs where a lot of folks are buying in the market and they're, they're really struggling to maintain. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a big complicated subject, um, but I look forward to ongoing conversations about yeah, it. Yeah, I think it, it, it we need to do something about it, and even worse than that, I think, is the cliff effect when it comes to people that are in housing developments, and cliff effect when it comes to people that have IDP units that that oh, I'm five dollars over the, the requirement. What should I do? Like yeah. that to me, that to me is counterproductive in everything that we're trying to do in, in the way in the way we help people. Um, did have one more. I'm going to go to you and come and come back. Hold yeah. on, let me make sure, sure it's you first. Yes, Councilor Durkin. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate this and um, really appreciated um, the chair's passion about so many of these things. And as someone um, 
who is trying to work on transportation planning and development. I feel like I actually really appreciated those terms and the rebuffs and <laughs> sort of the comments about sort of like let's back up what are all what are developers being asked to do and what are the different tools in the toolbox. Um, so I actually have District 8 really has a different tact in terms of um, you know Councillor Baker's comments around you know we want uh, units for our people. Uh, my district wants units for everyone else. Um, you know what I've heard from uh, you know uh, most all of my district is in a zone A, um, except for Mission Hill, which is in zone B. Um, but it, you know, we, in my district, there really is a passion for making sure that, um, and, and Chief Dillon, you know this because of um, the West End Library revitalization and everything that's going on over there around um, encouraging public housing um, in, in the city on public projects. So just, um, we, so I just wanted to state that, that my district sort of takes a different tact in that respect. We want people from all over the city to be able to enjoy our downtown neighborhoods, um, Back Bay Beacon Hill, West End, um, Back Bay, um, and you know, I have Fenway and Mission Hill. So um, really just wanted to state that because I think um, while some folks maybe want more people from their neighborhood particularly to be, have access to this housing, um, I think what my district sees is that everyone having access to being able, you know, to be near transit hubs um, is, is really something that's worthwhile for the whole city. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate that my constituents feel that way. Um, so just wanted to ask a little bit about um, how can we ensure that vouchers are used throughout the city, um, given what I just stated about um, my district. And uh, what we want to make sure is that um, this, these vouchers are really used from an equity perspective to make sure that every single neighborhood absorbs affordable housing and absorbs um, and welcomes voucher uh, holders with uh, open arms. So I'll start, but certainly, um, please, uh, my colleagues should chime in. Um, so you, you are, the, what I know about your district is um, that uh, the, your constituents have been very interested in having a lot of the, the IDP units on site because for parts of your district it's very, very hard, except for the like West End Library and a few other opportunities, it's really hard to build new affordable units in your district. So having IDP on site has, has been really important. It's certainly Mission Hill where we're looking to build more affordable housing and, and Pat Flaherty and Parker Terrace and there's, there's some good opportunities there. So when we, we do every year look at, and um, Councillor uh, uh, Fernandez Anderson um, would, 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 is also very aware of this, when we look at uh, where affordable housing is across the city, uh, some, city, some parts of our city has very low uh, percentages of affordable housing and then others um, such as D7 have very high percentages. So we are very, very interested in, uh, to your point, making sure that, um, that we are building and preserving affordable housing in every neighborhood and where there are neighborhoods with the lower than the citywide average of affordable housing, 19.2%. 19 .2 that we're really uh, uh, prioritizing and um, not insisting, we don't have a legal mechanism to insist, but really, um, really encouraging new affordable housing in those neighborhoods. Last week I was in West Roxbury and we broke ground, on, no, we cut a ribbon, sorry, on 60 units of new rental housing in West Roxbury. And that was very exciting because they have a very low, they have a lower percentage of, of affordable housing. So could not agree with you more that we need to see affordable housing and voucher usage uh, really across the city. And um, it shouldn't be. Neighborhoods are stronger when there's when they're racially diverse, when they're income diverse. So we really, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So I think we have a lot of say over developments. Um, the vouchers we uh, are have are a little harder because it's hard to tell someone with the voucher where they should live and where they shouldn't live. They, they, choose, they choose their locations for a whole host of reasons. But I think our job is to make people aware that their voucher can go everywhere. And that is a fairly new development. It's like, what, two, two and a half, three years old where the BHA started to pay small area FMRs. So we really need to continue to educate. I know the BHA is spending a lot of time on this for voucher holders. Wherever you want to live, what's best for your family and you, uh, we're going to make it happen. So more work to be done, but I, I certainly share, share your opinion. And I just say um, there is 
way more work to be done um, to diversify our neighborhoods and make sure that everyone has access to some of the opportunities that residents of my district do. Um, and I think um, seeing that citywide commitment that the administration has um, to upping the IDP is a huge, is a great step in the right direction. But again, it's not everything we possibly could do. So I appreciate um, and, and understand that there's a huge opportunity to learn from you three about what might, um, what, where we could go in, in other directions. But I'm really supportive of this proposal. I think, um, I think it strikes a balance. And seeing the letters from some of these groups that you know may still take issue um, with um, with some of these changes, I think it's very hard to make changes to um, in a commercial environment. Um, and I think that this proposal really does strike a balance. Um, and seeing that everyone is a little bit unhappy sometimes means that you're making the right call. So um, I appreciate uh, the pragmatic nature of like what this proposal is and excited to learn more and uh, continue uh, learning since I'm in my seventh week on the city council. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Councilor Baker. Um, great conversation. Um, one issue that I came across in our early days and we looked at it and then COVID hit and everything changed into a different world. Um, the, the issues around um, the process of, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a voucher um, and you have, uh, there, there's just a, a sort of a bureaucratic swamp that you have to get through. You find a unit that your landlord wants to rent. Mm -hmm. um, you have to uh, have your, uh, have it all approved. Um, the inspection, BHA inspectors have to inspect the unit to make it up to, up to, up to speed, um, code compliant. Is there a way that we can do, like pre-certify voucher holders, uh, just as you would get pre-certified for a mortgage or whatever, pre-approved, get the paperwork in line so that when you go to look at a, 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 a unit, that, that you don't have weeks and weeks and weeks of delay. Because landlords have gone like, I can rent this unit tomorrow. Why would I wait and lose a month's rent or two months' rent because the, we have such a crazy bureaucracy that doesn't yeah. process these, these units quickly? Yeah. Uh, well, I know, and I, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna answer your question, but um, right. I will say that the, the, the mayor has very much asked us to look at the process for marketing and getting uh, renters and homeowners into the IDP units. Uh, when uh, Mayor Wu came into office, she was very dissatisfied with what she was hearing, that uh, the BPDA does a piece, MOH does a piece. Um, we often would delay things until a developer had a certificate of occupancy. The marketing agents are doing income certifications. We're doing income certifications, so we, have, we are really turning that on its head and cut, we, cutting the time down by at least 50% and making sure that when a unit is available and it's completed and has a certificate of occupancy, someone is giving keys, right? So she is, she's been very clear that she wants improvements. That's IDP. What you're raising is the delays around the BHA and this is what I'm not gonna answer. I, I know that Administrator Bach also wants to do that, look at those improvements and look at the process and she's been making like really you know, some staffing changes and beefing up some of her, her divisions. So I would suggest that, um, that give her a little bit of time, but I would suggest that you, we have some meaningful conversations with uh, her vision for making the process easier. We don't want to discourage landlords from renting to Section 8 holders. They, they can't by law, you can't discriminate, and uh, you all know this, you can't discriminate based on the, the source of, of rent, the source of, of one's income, but you don't have to sit around and wait forever either. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we, we really do have to make it easier for landlords to get tenants and for tenants to get into units. So I would welcome coming back with Administrator Bach if that would be helpful, but I, I do really think that I've got to defer to her on, on her perceived or her anticipated improvements. And I know this is really tangential, gone off, <laughs> gone off really badly here. But in the news this week, there's, there's talk about thousands of, of public, um, publicly owned 
uh, affordable housing units that are mm -hmm. uh, vacant because of deferred maintenance, they're not up to code. Uh, it's, it's in the moment of crisis that we're in, is there any way that we can sort of prime the pumps and get pull, yeah. pull out all the stops and get those units yeah. back in line again? So I know I know it's a budget issue, but is there any yeah. way we can supplement federal or whatever funding that we can there um, my understanding and um, is that they are all state funded public housing units um, and I'm pulling this number out, but I, I think of the 20, 20 was it 2300 2600 something like that that were, there were vacant statewide. Um, a very small amount uh, of those units were in Boston. Boston, and they were really just doing their their regular turnover. I mean, so there wasn't. I, I'm I'm not aware of any that were out, off uh, offline for any length of time. So I don't think it, Boston Boston continues to invest in its public housing. Mm -hmm. Other smaller communities yeah. can't or aren't. So yeah. um, I think it is a state issue. So yeah. um, one that we are certainly and we invest in both federal and state. Uh, public housing units, but we're you know I can't we can't influence yeah. other communities. Yeah. You know um, I appreciate that it's a state issue. Uh, the knock-on effect of it that if there's capacity in other spaces that isn't ready to go, that those those voucher units, those voucher holders can come to Boston and look for housing. So if they can't get it wherever they are, <laughs> they can come to us and they'll they'll increase our list as well. So um, you know. I'll, I'll, we'll talk to this. We'll talk to them at the state level. Very good. Um, the other issue I have, and it's it's not, again, is the notion that these projects, and this is a question for Arthur, um, Chief Jemison. Um, you know, the 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 approval of a project, uh, and we have worked really hard over years sometimes to get all our ducks in a row and get as maximum amount of of affordability and. Good, good mitigation, good community benefits, and then the developer turns around and flips it and makes millions, like I'm talking tens of millions in some cases. One particularly egregious one that we talk about, the project has been uh, marketed for 100 and 200 million or something crazy. Like, when, when can we just say stop enough? This is, we definitely desperately need to have the transfer tax and ASAP so that this, this business of, of mm. getting approvals for buildings and then flipping them and making tens of millions of dollars of profit on the backs of our neighborhoods, when can we stop that? Like, it's, 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 an, it's insane. Through the chair of council of Breeden. Um, um, thank you for making me aware of not just one example. Last time I was here, we had one. I think we've got two or three now, um, unfortunately. Um, so on the transfer tax, I think everyone at this on this table is uh, will tell you that uh, the administration is in favor of a transfer tax. Um, so uh, I don't think that's I think that's probably broadly known, um, and we've sh certainly shared our view with uh, the with the legislate with members of the legislature uh, and the administration. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, we have to be careful to send the right message, but we do need to evaluate whether or not, I think I've said this in a very similar circumstance before, um, you know, what is the right duration for an approval to exist, uh, a new approval that, that we might um, approve in a future month? How long should it uh, be as is before it becomes something else? Um, that's a question that we're um, thinking about as part of our Article 80 modernization, and um, I think we'll have an opinion to share about that um, in, in coming months, but we think it's something that needs to be looked at. I appreciate that. And, and you know, we had a period of very low interest rates and got all these home ownership pro projects approved, and they sat on them, they didn't develop them, and now we've got increased interest rates, and they're so much harder. And, I think, you know, I agree, I approve that we need to push them along and say, if you get approval, there's a time limit. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, is it accurate that RKG, RKG is it RKG, mm -hmm. the consulting company, um, stated to increase requirements over time um, that would 
I guess that, that add predictability for developers and property owners. I I'd have to go back and look. I don't I don't remember that being and I, I was rereading the report for the last couple of days and I don't think I saw that. You mean that, that a predictable increase over time would be Right. Yeah. I don't recall them saying that. I I do recall them saying multiple times that predictability is, you know, it's what developers crave and what they need uh, as they put together their pro formas. I'd be glad to look into that. I, I, I read the report quickly the last couple of days again, um, but I, let me go back and, and see if that's in there. Thank you. Um, so after the city adopts the new requirements, which would be, I guess, safe to say 15 to 20 percent. Um, depending on project size and AMIs, of course, um, could it increase the percentage requirement in future years over time? Is that, is that something you've thought about? So um, through the Chair to Councilor uh, Fernandez Anderson, I, I recall um, advocates, um, and I think even um, some of the consultants that had, were engaged by advocates asking the question, well, why don't you create future year increases to IDP that are automatic and I think we we certainly considered that I don't think that that was a recommendation of the RKG plan although Sheila um, and I will look um, I think saying that there's a guaranteed increase in the cost of doing business in Boston um, that is not connected to other costs um, didn't seem certainly to me I didn't think I didn't see it as a a good direction to go in. Um, I think we, I think that especially in an environment where in one year the number one cost of the, the developers have to deal with uh, would be, you know, which is building materials would go up the way that they went up and that the next year the, because of the cost of building materials going up, uh, interest rates would, would go up. I think those are things that if we had an automatic increase We'd have to come into the. We'd have to come in and enact a reduction in it, in the rate of increase. And as you've seen, other other cities have really struggled to do that. Where um, it suddenly becomes, we're not having any production, we're not having any development, and they have to come in and um, radically change the policy in order to to create uh, a pipeline of construction. So, I, I certainly um, remember that advocates making that request. But I think um, that it was my recommendation, at least, that we make the uh, we go forward with the policy that's before you today, and that we not guarantee increases in future years. But that in an environment like this, after some uh, real thinking among counselors and advocates and policymakers, that we uh, arrive at a new conclusion in the future. Not going into that direction mm -hmm. or not being able to predict the market, um, are, are you saying it's affordability on the city standpoint at this point or just, I mean, the added on non-predictability, but also could we afford to do more? Could we step in and subsidize the portion that would give the developer the return that would make sense or are we being safe until we pilot this thing? So, through the Chair of Council of Fernandez Anderson, I tend to look at it like this. So we've got 23,000 units that are permitted at 13 percent, but I haven't been constructed. If you take out 10 percent, 10,000 of those units that are associated with a few very large projects, um, you've got at least 10,000 units, maybe more, that are where people have 10 percent, 13 percent IDP. And they can't build those projects under those circumstances. So um, to me, saying I'm going to now increase the cost of building um, mixed income development effectively uh, in the future, um, I think we're taking a pretty, I mean, to be quite direct, I think we're making a, a, a very bold message of our intent by increasing IDP from 13 to 17 with the additional 3%. And I think there's a risk of sort of um, decreasing the appetite of our development industry to take on new projects and take on the, the kind of 20% uh, uh, IDP that we're talking about by, by increasing it more or asking that it be increased again in future years. I, I think what we 
think we're taking a really important step together and saying it's been eight years since this was increased. Let's increase it thoughtfully and let's take a lot of uh, input and information and then make a decision together. Uh, I, I think if we're, if we're trying to move to a place where private developers opening units, new units that are deeply subsidized for uh, Bostonians, I want to get closer to starting those units and having them open and having someone move in rather than focusing on maybe I could get another 1% this year, maybe I could get another 2% next year. I'd rather say we're going to go up 7% now and then we're going to try to get every possible unit built. I feel like we got to, the right, we have the right, I think, process, the right dynamics. We've got smart, well-intentioned um, players um, who are all coming together to, to recommend the policy we've got, or even to push and pull on it. But I think we're making the right recommendation uh, for now. I appreciate the practical approach. Um, I guess there are so many other nuances to, the, to it as well to be considered when it comes to development, not just mm -hmm. um, cost directly to material, but also the individual developer loans that they qualify for, uh, different amenities or other attributes that may be added post-community uh, engagement, right? So then can that developer qualify for commercial space? Could that developer act actually afford to include other things that may come out of that uh, meeting? And I think that often there's this uh, divide between community and developer as though they're the, they're the enemy and um, it gets tricky in explaining and breaking down the numbers and all of the nuances and why they're taking the positions that they are taking. Um, in 2021, and I guess sort of a caveat to the, um, our follow-up question, Mayor Wu set a goal for 20% affordability. Um, and I guess me asking if, if we could actually set a certain goal or if we're not there yet at 20%. Um, then could we set a goal at some point to increase it to a minimum of 25% um, requiring in the future years over time? And if, if, the, if the answer is the same, please let me know. Um, through, through the Chair of Council, Fernandez Anderson. So uh, the great news for everyone is that I have the benefit of other experts uh, on my team and, and other parts of the city to help make decisions like this and, and advocates. I, I guess I would probably have the same answer that I provided earlier, but I think, Sheila, if you'd like to add. No, I would just add that, you no, know, I know that um, that Mayor Wu was interested in certainly reviewing and, and increasing the affordability associated with the IDP policy. And we've had, all of us have had numerous conversations with her about it. It was, after we did the analysis, we found it was very difficult to just say, yep, 20% <clears throat> at, you know, we, we really, uh, because of uh, increased in co uh, costs, uh, development costs, uh, rising uh, interest rates, that we had to come up with this hybrid of units plus uh, the, the Section 8 units that would provide additional income. So I think it is hard to say that in the future we can do X percentage. I think every time we look at this policy, we're going to have to do the same uh, sometimes painful analysis to see what's, what is feasible. And as I mentioned earlier, the variables change. The interest rates will change and construction costs will change and land, land values will change and market rate rents will change too, which is also a really important variable when you're looking at feasibility. Rents from 21 to 22 went up 12 percent across the board, offsetting some. Anyways, so you get it. So there's just a lot. There's a lot of variables. So I think that we can. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest we do it in the near future. I'd suggest that we do it years from now, maybe you know five years from now. But look again at uh, all the variables to see if the policy needs to be reshaped and changed. Can we go higher? Do we need to go lower? Hopefully not. We never have in the in the policy's history. Uh, gone lower, um, so but I, I think it's hard to predict the future with so many variables, sort of especially now in flux. So I would say we can't pin and we can't say that a certain percentage will be uh, that we can realize a certain percentage at a certain date. I do believe we need to do the analysis. 
Um, thank you, Chief Dillon. You've, you've stated um, that the city would revisit the policy um, in three years and in the new inclusionary zoning, um, if, if the new inclusionary zoning is passed or the changes are passed, then by December 20, 23rd, uh, would this mean that the goal would be to pass additional changes by 26? I'm sorry, Councilor. Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Um, if, you're, if we're to revisit um, this policy within three years, and if this passes in December 2023rd, three years would be December 2026, then would that be a good, a reasonable deadline for us to revisit? Yeah. I, I would think we would, and please, I'm kind of looking at my colleagues for their opinion as well. I would think, although we can certainly caucus and, and get back to you, but I think we would be looking at a certain amount of time after the revised policy goes into effect. So we're suggesting this policy go into effect in October of 2024. I would suggest that, it, that we evaluate the policy again at some date certain after that, after that point in time. Like not now, but that we would do it when the policy goes into effect because we're not gonna be able to analyze what happens with the policy until that point. So not hard set on three years, but at some point. Thank you. Um, I guess in thinking about development overall in, you know, again, obviously agree with the changes, would love to see more. We all would love to see more. You would like to see more. Um, and th considering, you know, HUD policies in terms of not prioritizing our local residents or by demographics, considering all of the restrictions that we have in terms of our um, revenue uh, source and uh, guidelines that we have to follow, then looking at District 7 and understanding that we have a lot of parcels in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. We have um, hopefully an amazing project coming to business corridors that will be anti-displacement, not mm -hmm. in responsible development. I, the, finding the balance between community and hopefully extending Roxbury strategic master plan is definitely a huge challenge. So I, I look forward to conversations about zoning or further conversations about zoning, one that is truly inclusive, but that considers in depth the AMIs that we are dis, uh, neglecting. Um, if we continue in this pattern, it's a positive thing, but it's the lesser of two evils, right? Or the lesser of evils, and mm -hmm. it's not really addressing our most vulnerable. That's heartbreaking for all of us. Um, so I look forward to hopefully for this city for us to find a solution where we are prioritizing the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If that means exploring um, the uh, idea or the hearing order that Council Lujan and I uh, filed in exploring um, looking into bonds to uh, resolving our housing issues um, or other alternative and creative methods. Look forward to the work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Council Murphy. Um, just wanted to follow up on the vouchers. I know there were a few cases, um, Sheila, where I had to reach out. It does seem like some very minor clerical errors could stop someone from moving in. There was one incident where there was uh, a young mom who had a voucher and it was a seven dollar difference between what the voucher said and what the apartment was listed. I remember that. And the homeowner was very, very willing to change it, but because it can't be different, even yeah. though it was actually the rent was like less than the voucher, she lost it in a neighborhood that was close to her special ed son's school. Like it was just it made me realize like bureaucracy here, there's gotta be a way to fix it. Um, so definitely would um, like to talk more at some point and really, yeah. our, our, you know, this body really help fix that program in a yeah. way that things like that don't happen to um, to people. Totally agree. I remember that case, it was heartbreaking. And I thought that, right, that the owner was willing to take less. Yeah, um, and I yeah. And I thought, although you and I can uh, caucus afterwards, but I thought the BHA, corrected that so no no they didn't yeah oh. and then Sorry. like was just said yes. it was going to be another two or three months that they would go without 
So she had to go back into the market of looking for a house, which she stills at mom's house, right? So there hasn't been a placement yet. Yeah. Um, so obviously um, just trying to make that work better so that people get into the housing they need. Um, and nothing else really just wanted to say, Councilor Baker, as my district councilor, I will miss your institutional knowledge and your always advocating for housing needs. So thank you for chairing this meeting. I'll miss you here. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to Councilor Louis-Jean for her last round. I think it's your last round. If you have another one, we can go again. And I also want to um, acknowledge Councilor Flaherty. We'll get to you for an opening statement in your, in your questions after Councilor Louis-Jean. Councilor Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank the administration again for indulging all of my questions. I know it was like a long round and back and forth. but care deeply about this as uh, a lot of my colleagues do and I want to um, just make sure that the public is aware, um, you know, whether they're in East Boston, again, that depend like how this is going to affect them. Um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson talked about bonding for housing, um, increasing our, our, how we use our fiscal strength as a city to really engage in that work uh, in our limited ways that we're able to bond and uh, affordable housing is one of them and so I, I, I want to just uh, always elevate that. Uh, the two questions I really had have been asked by my fellow colleagues for the most part, but there are some, I just wanted to push a little bit on them. We, uh, Councilor Braden brought up uh, issues like with IDP and uh, like the delay in getting pe people into units. Do we know what the IDP vacancy rate is? Yes, it's extremely no, low now, but um, a year ago it was, you know, it, it was it was not as low as it is now. Um, I want to say I'm, I'm making this. I'm not making it up. I think there's about 50 or 60 vacant units right now, uh, but one development has 34, 35 of those units because we're working on a change of ownership and a change of program, and so it's it, the, the wait is justified. So we're down to very, very few. Um, a lot of those um, vacant units, the remaining ones, and there's really not that many at this point, is when a developer comes in and is making a change. They want to change where the units are located or their their project, they're changing it from rental to home ownership or home ownership to rental or, or that. And so they have got work, they've got some work they need to do with the BPDA. So, but we've had great success reducing the number of vacant units <clears throat> and now the work to shorten the the complexity, the bureaucracy, and the time it takes to market units is is really um, is is being worked on right now. Uh, progress is already being made, and we have we had phase one improvements, and now we're looking at phase two improvements that are more structural. But um, I think the developers and the general public are really going to feel a difference. Thanks. And and how did we get that number down? Um, meeting every single week across divisions and departments and saying who's calling the developer who's doing this who's doing the paperwork at the bpda what's wrong with the market like just really workshopping it project managing it awesome well done chair to um council member Legion. so we've also uh i think the mayor talked about this in the most recent speech are making some uh and made some structural changes to um, strengthen uh, and bring our team closer to uh, closer to Sheila's team as part of that. I think she described it pretty accurately, this working together in a much more concerted way uh, to close the gap. Awesome. Um, and then my last question was about, um, I think it was, maybe it was Councilor Fernandez who was talking about the automatic set aside and I just want to explore something I mentioned in my opening which is the role that having of that having like an automated increase uh, baked into uh, the code the role that that could have on land speculation and on buyers and developers realizing the affordability requirements baking that in such that the cost the, the cost of the land takes into account the affordability attachment with that. And that could be something, an advantage of having um, automatic, a more automatic prediction of what 
IDP will be in the future that, that helping to tamp down on um, on the land speculation and the, sh and the extraction that we see. So just want to see if you have thoughts there. I do. Um, I, I think it is a very solid comment that if uh, landowners and developers expect that uh, a, an obligation is going to increase, that the, it's going to change um, some of the variables in a, in, a, in a real estate project, the price of land being one of them. I right, think like the price of land could decrease. It could decrease. Which would, which would be helpful at, for a number, at actually, it's yeah. another way of us getting more affordable housing. Is what I'm trying yes, to say. My, my only, my, so I agree, with, I agree with you there. And um, that's part of the problem that we've had is that like the, the lack of really economists at the BPDA to really mm. think about or to challenge what the cost and the value of this land should be. And so I think right. that we should use our code to address that. I just, my, my, my second part of, of um, my thought is that, and while land is a really important piece of a development, it's not all. Mm. So I go back to um, my earlier comment and I, and I, and I stand by it that uh, it might, it might lessen uh, the, the appreciation of land, but there's so many other variables that go into making real estate deal, you know, work and finance, uh, financeable so that I'd be hesitant to say that X is going to happen in, in a future date without understanding all the variables. So it's my opinion, and not everyone will probably agree, that you do need to look at all of the variables, including interest rates and cost of construction and rents and all of that, mm -hmm. including land values, um, at a certain point in time if you're going to, to increase the um, requirement. So I do think it would impact values of land, but I think there's other things that would have to be considered simultaneously. If, if I might, um, through the chair to Council Illusion, I guess I would, um, I mean, I would, do want to make sure, did you say that we, that the BPDA does not have the benefit of having economists to make the recommendation that you're suggesting? No, I, I think, and I'm sorry for including that, because I think that's actually, it's, it's a related point, but it's not exactly on par. Um, I think it, it goes to the question, that latter point goes to the question of like being able to challenge a developer when they say that a project isn't feasible. And often there are times when that, um, when, the reason they give is for the, well, I bought the land at this amount, right? And the expectation of, of, of what, the, what their return is going to be based on how much they had to purchase the land. And what I'm saying is like, well, let's bake into on the front end as much as we can that the purchase of the land comes with this affordability attachment. So it's sort of like two separate but connected points. And I'm sorry I, for the I think it's, I understand what you're saying, I think. And I... I guess what I'd say is, for the last 10 to maybe 15 years, we've had two things. One of the things is a very Boston-centric phenomenon, but we've had two things happen. We've had almost 0% interest rates. So um, having such low interest rates has made it possible for people to do things, including you know everybody from a person who gets a very low interest rate on a, on a mortgage to a developer gets a very low interest rate on buy, allowing them to buy a property. Um, and so that, that has really created a kind of an inflated sense of what the value of all property is. The other thing I'd say is unique for, for Boston is we've had the benefit of our economy being strong in a particular sector, which has allowed lab development, which is extremely valuable, to, uh, to take place. Um, and both those things have really created a sense of the market um, as being able to, so I guess what I'd say now is we've had a very harsh correction by the Federal Reserve in the cost of money. Um, and I think, you know, when developers are talking to us, and again, I think we all, we recognize the importance and value of developers. We also have the appropriate regulatory skepticism that we should always have. But I do think that when you say that the cost of their money, the money they use to build things has changed radically the cost of materials and the relative strength of, of the lab sector is, have, has changed a little bit. Saying we're going to have an automatic, we're going to depress the value of land using a policy instrument, I just feel like we're now getting into like a, a level of like macroeconomic 
understanding that doesn't seem like I would, even as a person who represents government, I would want to, I, I would want to go into that space very carefully. Um, uh, so, in that vein, I guess I would I would say back, in, having it increase every year automatically might have a, um, a, a, a effect of that work that you're describing, but it might also have a series of other effects that we don't want. Um, and I think the key thing I guess I'm very focused on lately is the appetite of the development industry to do more than approve projects but build them. And I think what we've seen with the uh, is a uh, we're in a moment where we actually are beginning to see uh, a desire to have a lot of stuff that's been permitted actually be built so it can be used. Um, kind of mismatch with the the market uh, the the way that the market's operating interest rates cost of materials and the value of, of a lab space so I, I feel like we're we're in a good a good place we've we've taken a effectively a seven percent increase in the what we're demanding of the market to provide maybe it's a it's a harsh correction too like their interest rates um, to account for the changes in value, but I think we need to continue to have a deliberative process like the one we're having now, in my view, to make those kinds of increases as opposed to something that's automatic. Um, I, I would just highlight that, that other communities have, have had to recently change policies backwards mm -hmm. so that they can allow development to go forward. I think we have achieved a balance here um, with the development industry that allows us to make a very significant increase, but not disturb, I think, people's interest and excitement about growing in Boston. So I, I think your question's well, well may, uh, asked. I understand that I'm just a little hesitant about getting into affecting macroeconomic things like the cost of land. Um, thank you. Um, I appreciate those responses. I think that there's more conversation probably to be had about what the effect of that would be and sort of like what the intention is um, in a lot of our neighborhoods that have seen, right, that the cost of land has been, if not always a causal relationship, a correlation with displacement. And so my comment is nothing more than an attempt at how do we prevent that displacement that we're seeing, that we've seen in Jamaica Plain, that we see in East Boston, that is creeping, it was in Dorchester. So um, that's what that was getting at. But I do appreciate the difficulty, right, of these conversations and the seesaw effect. Um, and as a city, cities that are meant to develop, how do we do that in a way that is inclusive, in a way that shares a prosperity, that is, we are a wealthy city. The point of using bonding is that we have a AAA bond rating that shows the fiscal strength of the city, and that almost, I mean, look, not an economist, but that shows the enduring economics of this city and what our strengths are. And we have a strong economy based on meds and eds, based on the presence of institutions that are in the city. And I think like, there are things that we can take as true, even if not permanently true, that we can take as true in assessing like how do we, how do we a attack what we all see, which is the displacement in a city that is the second most expensive city to rent. Um, but I, I appreciate the administration for your efforts here. I'm excited about this IDP policy, excited for, for what is and what is to come. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're done, Council? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Council Flaherty, um, I guess open a statement and some questions. And we've also been joined by Council. You have Erin Murphy at your thing, but that's Julia Mejia. I'm with Okay, good. Council Mejia. No, Council Flaherty, you're on. You Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I won't, um, won't belabor the point. I've, been, I've had back to back to backs in my office, so I've been uh, dialed in listening to comments. Uh, so I'll just do a quick combo of an opening and a couple quick questions, uh, or an opine, if you will. It's obviously great to see um, our folks here, the uh, Chief of Planning uh, and Director of the BPDA, and as well as uh, Sheila from Chief of Housing, we go back a lot of years, uh, not so long with uh, Amy Chambers, but so uh, welcome and look forward to working with you uh, for the time that I have left. But I do have a longer history with uh, Sheila and, and Arthur, uh, back to my uh, BRA days as well. So, uh, And I appreciate your attention to detail. I know it's a difficult conundrum we're in 
uh, as referenced by some uh, I heard on the uh, on the, the uh, TV earlier that um, you know, we are seeing ourselves Manhattanized. We've been at this a long time trying to find a way to um, maintain Boston's affordability. It's a good news, bad news. We've got the best colleges and universities in the world, the best hospitals, uh, a network of community health centers. We're home to life science and financial services. Everybody wants to be here. We've got great sports teams, uh, a great theater and arts program, and uh, that's the good news. The bad news is as a result of that. And if you remember, um, both Arthur and Sheila, when I joined, um, there was a survey that the BRA did at the time, and the largest demographic, when I joined the council, the largest demographic leaving the city uh, were men and women in their uh, just recent graduates in their early 20s. Mm -hmm. They were heading to the Carolinas and out to San Francisco, et cetera. That has obviously reversed. Folks come here now from all over the world, come to get a degree, they fall in love with Boston, and then they stay, and they're sort of part of our brain power. Uh, and so, again, good news, bad, bad news story. My concern is the city kids, and I call them city kids, as the kids like my age, the yeah. 21, 22, 23, 24. Uh, they grew up here, uh, they played sports here, they were uh, in the arts programs here, they grew up in the Boys and Girls Club, grew up in public housing. Their parents are here, their grandparents are here, but they can't afford uh, to stay here. Uh, and that's the, that's the absolute travesty, when we lose city kids and we sort of lose that fabric of our neighborhoods. And so, uh, while we're paying attention to those sort of on both ends of the spectrum, um, the very poor and the very rich, uh, my focus wants to be on, um, on on the middle of the road there and making sure that we're maintaining a middle class. And those that I'm worried about is the young men and women from our neighborhoods who uh, who have gone to school. Uh, they uh, have a good entry level, good paying job, not crushing it, mm -hmm. but just making just mm -hmm. a little too much that they don't qualify for any of the programs that BPDA and D&D &D offer. They're just missing it, yet they're not making uh, nearly enough to, to sustain the market forces, and so uh, my ask is within, when we're going from 13 to 17, particularly on properties, uh, and again, I, I was um, listening to some of my colleagues' comments, and some are not, not, not sure, sure fully aware of the actual costs that go into developing. And let's start with acquisition costs, and there's a clear difference between someone that's owned a piece of property for 10, 20, or sometimes 50 years and they decide, all right, we're going to now develop that property. Mm -hmm. Actual acquisition cost is zero. They've got tremendous flexibility within that footprint mm -hmm. versus someone that comes in and pays through the nose uh, or borrows uh, you know, a big stain from a bank, mm -hmm. a little bit more pressure, um, a little more skin in the game, mm -hmm. and that, gets, that world gets a lot tighter, particularly in an economy like this, adding on to city's housing goals, putting on new regulations at the fire code, putting on Birdo that this body and, mm -hmm. and the administration passed, uh, makes things real tight, real fast for some. And so making that distinguishing uh, decision between, all right, this is someone that's owned the property for 50 years, they have a lot more flexibility versus mm -hmm. uh, and allowing a sliding AMI. So whether it's going from 13 to 17, identify those sites that, you know, and give them flexibility on the AMI to allow for that targeted group that I'm talking about, those city kids mm -hmm. uh, that are born and raised here, that we want to stay here, and yet they're getting priced out. And it won't be at the AMIs that we're currently looking at at the 13%. Uh, we did, uh, we had a pilot program at, uh, over at Washington Village. Uh, I think they took five units out of their hole, and they did a sliding scale. And there was tremendous participation, uh, again, from, you know, sort of moderate to, to middle class uh, individuals. Again, some may be strapped with a little student loan debt. Some may have a car payment, maybe a gym membership. A good job, but again, not really knocking it out of the park, and maybe moving up the ladder, but it may take some time. We're losing those kids to, to the South Shore and to the North Shore and to, to other communities. And so if we have some flexibility in that 13 to 17, uh, or we have someone willing to do more than 17, we give them that flexibility to make that AMI. And you guys know the numbers better than I. Maybe it's 120, maybe it's 130, maybe it's 140. Again, we're targeting a certain group of folks that um, you know, we, want, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to, to stay in the city that they were born and raised in. So that's kind of conundrum uh, number one. Um, and then the second piece is around identifying which properties have that type of flexibility and which ones don't. Um, if we're treating everyone that comes to the counter uh, you know, upstairs as, as equal, but yet you know, it's a family that's owned that site for 50 years versus someone that's trying to make it work. It's a, it's a completely different um, pro forma. What a lot of my colleagues don't realize is the process of 
architectural cost, engineering cost, legal cost, delays and deferrals costs on top of construction cost, on top of uh, financing cost, on top of insurance cost, in addition to the final product, which will be uh, occupancy in uh, taxes, insurance, maintenance and repair. All of those are real uh, for anyone that's willing to get into the uh, housing development game. Um, you know, and listening to some, it might, I, I, I would want to live in a house that they built, uh, it would be something like similar to, to uh, the Goldilocks, but to, 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 to put good quality housing uh, in our portfolio and having good housing stock in the city, it requires a significant investment and commitment and risk. My colleagues, no one talked about risk uh, today. Maybe Council Baker did, but so just again, finding that balance, finding that healthy balance where we continue to move our city forward. We're recognizing we have an affordability issue. Uh, it looks as though we're, we're, we have folks on the high end covered. Looks like we've got folks on the low end covered. We've got significant public private partnership and investment in public housing. Uh, my neighborhood probably setting the pace with uh, the Ann Lynch Homes, uh, formerly the O'Colony Project, where I was born, uh, the Old Harbor Village, which is Maryland McCormick, which we've got a significant uh, commitment. We've got one in Charlestown, we've seen one in Easton. So we're seeing that public-private partnership, which is good, um, and clearly a lot of the high-end stuff uh, has, that market has been met. It's really the middle, and Boston really depends on the middle class. Our neighborhoods depend on the middle class, public education, uh, de depends on the middle class, and uh, I just want to make sure that we have wh whatever we're doing here, we have an eye toward uh, making sure that um, city kids have an opportunity here, and and it may mean moving that AMI just a little bit higher than where it currently is to be able to capture uh, those uh, young men and women from all of the neighborhoods of Boston uh, in an effort to try to keep them uh, in their neighborhood uh, where their parents and their grandparents and their network and their friends are. And you think about uh, a lot of our success stories, they're relationship driven, they're partnership driven, uh, and having kids that are from the city that have those relationships with guys and girls they went to school with and played sports with, et cetera, and as they're entering into the economy and or they're networking uh, within a particular company or field, uh, nothing better than to have uh, that network versus kid gets priced out and has to go to, you know, down to, to uh, you know, where I pick a spot, anywhere in the south, southeastern mass. Um, South Shore and North Shore. And so for me, that's been a travesty, and we've seen it. We've had a front row seat for it. It is part of the, the good news, bad news. The bad news is that people are being priced out at, at arguably at all income levels, but the one that I would like to sort of see addressed in some form or fashion in this uh, new IDP formula is the flexibility for a developer, and it may be the developer that's leveraged. It may be the developer that paid a premium as an acquisition cost. Maybe that's the development project that's ripe for a little relief on the AMI, but we can accommodate uh, some of those moderate middle income uh, residents to be able to compete <coughs> to stay in their neighborhood uh, versus, again, someone that has owned that parcel for decades, does not have the acquisition cost conundrum, can eliminate a little bit of that pressure, has the ability not only to sustain these numbers at 17%, may even be able to go to 20% and or over 17 percent have the flexibility with a sliding AMI targeting uh, the middle class because uh, no one can afford, uh, you know, at least guys and girls I grew up with, they can't, and their kids can't afford the market rates that we're seeing uh, across the city. And so dipping that down a little bit, getting that AMI to a number that can maybe meet that demand. And there is a significant demand. I hear about it all the time. And the sons and daughters of our school teachers and our public works employees and uh, our librarians and our police officers and wife is, uh, we want them to stay here. Um, they're what makes our city the best city in the country and we're losing the middle class here and collectively, uh, Arthur and your wisdom and experience and Sheila and your wisdom and experience and, uh, and Amy and your wisdom and experience working with this council and administration, I think we have an opportunity to get this right. Uh, this clearly is a step in the right direction. I'd just like to have an ask of a little flexibility on that AMI exceeding the 13 or in situations where someone's exceeding uh, the 17 and really put in perspective the real costs and the real risks that are out there, particularly in, in this economy. Um, and we're seeing it significantly in it and we're going to feel the pinch. Uh, my colleagues haven't seen uh, something like this. I had gone through it. Um, Council Baker may have been at the printing shop when we seen, when we saw as a city a, a downturn where there were layoffs, there were pink slips. 
there were um, holes in the ground where there was no construction happening. Um, cranes were halted and stopped and kept in place for, for a few years. And we don't want to return to that type of situation either. We want to make sure we continue to, to move our city and to grow but, and to accommodate as many as we can. But that's one of my concerns. Um, and we're seeing it now with the commercial vacancy rate where companies, law firms, insurance companies, uh, financial service companies, even labs, they're now taking less square footage in their renewals by thousands of less square, lopping off floors. That's how we pay for our schools. That's how we pay for our parks and our playgrounds and our police department and our fire department and public works, snow plowing, tree pruning, uh, snow removal, trash collection, all of it. That's how we derive and that's how Boston ticks. It's really through our big partner is our commercial tax base. If we start to see our commercial tax vacancy rate um, continue to decline, that's a holy bleep moment uh, for Boston, for this council, for future budgets. Um, and so all of this is real. Uh, we don't really get to engage in these discussions all the time, but anyone that sits here that thinks that anyone that wants to build a house is just a fat cat millionaire, that's not true. There might be a couple of them that are, but that's just not the reality, that it's a profession, it's a business, and there's a lot of risk involved in it, and there's a lot of soft cost and high cost. Yeah. And the same with our commercial, uh, our commercial properties. There are a lot of companies that call Boston their home. They're great partners. And this whole work from home thing, right, it's impacted not only municipal government and state government, but it's, it's impacted the private sector, whereby folks are allowing their employees to work from home, which means that they don't need all of that office space. And, which is why we're seeing major companies lop off uh, tens of thousands of square feet at per site, building after building after building. Uh, that's going to come to roost probably two, three, four years from now. Next year. And we're, <clears throat> we're going to feel a crunch. So all issues that we're well aware of, uh, I appreciate your attention to detail. If you can give some thoughts maybe to having some flexibility going from 13 to 17 on maybe a sliding AMI, particularly where there's capacity uh, or a need uh, from an, an owner or a developer that may be leveraged um, on the acquisition piece of it or having flexibility for someone to go from 17 to 20 because they've owned the site 30, 20, 30, 40 years and the acquisition cost is zero. They may have a little more flexibility and they may be willing to be a good neighbor and a good partner, but you've got to let them up a little bit, let them up for air and give them maybe a 120, 130, 140 AMI and they'll fill those, they'll fill those units immediately. Um, and it'll be a great contribution to what we're looking to do here, which is to, to save the middle class in Boston. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to open opine and ask a couple questions of uh, some very dedicated public servants and have been partners uh, over the years since I started here. Does anybody want to speak to that? So um, I'll start, but certainly. Any and all of it, Sheila, or whatever. We yeah. do have a hearing at, at 2 o'clock, and we have six more people that, that want to testify. Oh, in, my goodness. In, um, okay. Um, public. So we'll keep our answers and sure. our questions very, very brief. So I always appreciate uh, Councillor Flaherty, um, his, his concern about I, you know, the middle class in Boston. And, and he is correct that over, you know, just because of federal funding and state funding and city funding, uh, a lot of our uh, developments uh, don't necessarily serve th that those populations. I will, um, I will suggest, though, or offer that when I look, and I was looking at, at the AMIs as you as you were talking, that because we use a regional AMI, the AMIs that uh, we have right now because of raising uh, rising incomes. Um, are pretty high. In fact, a lot of people complain that our, program, our housing programs are serving folks that have too much, you know, too much income for our programs. So it, it is sort of a balancing act, trying to find the the right the right balance, the right the right incomes, the right. the sweet spot, if you will. And Sheila, if I may just inject, just for those what viewing at home, can you just can you just describe what what the levels of AMI and what does that mean in terms of real dough, like sure. a two person home, a three person sure. home? So uh, if when it was because we are, it's not we don't we don't use in our standards a, a Boston AMI. We use HUDs. Regional AMI and can, and, we, and can Boston have its own, own AMI? They could, of course. And the way that we the way that we get there is by saying instead of using 
the AMI for our area, which for a family of one is 103. For a family of two is 118. For a family of three is 133,000. We know that those incomes are much higher than many of our residents. So what we do is we bring the AMI percentages down. That's why we talk about 50% AMI, 60% AMI, 30% AMI, because we're really calculating for a Boston need against a federal standard, if you will. So, um, but I, lo I think uh, you know a lot of the IDP program has historically uh, served uh, a population that is um, that that is not uh, people that need public assistance. That it, that is it is more of a, a middle income, especially with the home ownership being 80 to 100 percent AMI. I just read those incomes. That's you know those are those are high. A lot of the a lot of the um, individuals that are buying our homes. Um, there's certainly there's families and there's also uh, folks that have gone to college and stay are staying here or have gotten <coughs> their first second or third job and I see a, I see a lot of those young couples buying or or a, an, in, a single individual so it is a balancing act we'd be glad to take your comments under advisement um, do appreciate that we need a range of incomes uh, in the city of Boston to make Boston tick and work well thank you thank you Sheila. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council, Council, Do Council McGee. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to uh, the administration for your work in this space. It's really appreciated, and I always want to take the opportunity to um, say on the record, Sheila, how your department is one of the best departments to. Um, provide constituent services to. I mean, I can send Danielle an email at 11 o'clock at night, and unfortunately, she is responding to it. Um, and so I'm so grateful. And I just, I'll just end with that, like, the gratitude is real. Um, and I also want to just share the reflections, like, coming into this uh, council I was talking about, 50% IDP, you know? Um, and I think that what we're trying to do is really meet the moment here in the city of Boston and really trying to think about how do we na navigate competing interests, right? How do we bring people together across those differences? Because, you know, at the end of the day, and there's one thing that I've discovered, particularly this last year, is that nobody has it right. Everybody's trying to figure it out and everybody believes that their way is the only way. And I don't think that that is the way we're gonna to get to where we need to be without leaving anyone behind. So I'm not, not there. I really am uh, about what is realistic. And what does that work look like um, in a way that centers the 700,000 constituents that we are here to represent? And I wanna start with that because I think that oftentimes we get ourselves caught up in who it is that we are here to fight for. And I want to be incredibly clear about what I believe this is about, right? It's about making sure that people who have grown up here, to my colleagues' point, are city kids who have gone through public education and then can't get into certain you know, universities or institutions that aren't meant for them. Um, so then they have to go to where they go, and then wherever they end up, they're not making enough money to stay here in the city of Boston. So they leave. So if the real intent of this conversation is to keep city kids here, then we're going to have to push ourselves to think about what that looks like. And I'll just give you a quick little example. I grew up here in the city of Boston, right? I have a really good friend who grew up in another part of Boston. And the only thing that she and I had in common was that we both were raised by single moms who were on welfare. But today, we both have homes that we can call our own, right? And so I'm that city kid, right? Other colleagues, I, don't, I can't call out names because there's, I don't want to call out names, but we're not supposed to do that. But other colleagues here are, are, are that too. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that. And so in that spirit, right, we, we know that a lot of people who have grown up here in the city of Boston are now living in Brockton, Stoughton, 
Randolph, they are being displaced. And there is no consequence to the city for that displacement, right? These folks are packing up and still having to travel here to the city of Boston to work. So now we're causing them further financial hardship because that's more gas that they have to spend, right? And some of them are traveling, you know, 45 minutes to an hour just to be able to work in the city that they once lived in. And as we're talking about this conversation around zoning and changing and meeting the moment, I'm just curious about where, where, in, where in that does it fit in terms of a displacement tax? I know that sounds kind of crazy, but I think that if we're really serious about holding ourselves accountable, we also have to hold ourselves accountable in a way that is going to impact our little pockets. So something has to give. If we're displacing people, then we need to be responsible for the people that we're displacing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that once they're done and out, that we're done with them. We have caused that harm. So I'm curious about how are we thinking about repairing that harm, if at all. That's one question. Uh, good afternoon, Councillor. Um, I, I'm going to attempt to uh, answer your question in, in part, at least. Um, I think that the administration has been thinking about a lot of different ways um, that we can approach uh, equity specifically through uh, our policies. Um, lately, we have um, been looking at a number of tools, IDP just being one of them, um, with relationship to how we address uh, concerns related specifically to the housing crisis. Um, one of the other things that we're working on presently is uh, zoning uh, related to accessory dwelling units. Um, to uh, Councillor Flaherty's previous remarks um, with relationship to how we provide opportunities to keep uh, city kids uh, in, uh, in the city, um, we want to create additional opportunities for uh, units to be able to come online um, on family properties, et cetera, um, that would, by virtue of the fact that they are, are smaller units, um, provide opportunity for more affordable, uh, more affordable development, um, perhaps not subsidized through any particular program. Um, we have named here today that uh, you know this is just one kind of tool within the toolbox, and that we need to be trying to create as many tools as possible in order to be successful with regard to some of these concerns. Um, one of the other things that we've really begun discussing um, in relationship to the new zoning initiative um, that we are planning and zoning initiative that we're embarking on in the spring, um, squares and streets, is around how if we are looking to promote housing um, in our neighborhood nodes um, to, promote, to promote additional housing and to promote additional development in those locations, how we actually employ really clear anti-displacement policies. Okay. Um, and we want to make sure that we're using that to kind of govern the decisions that we make as we move through that planning process. So that doesn't answer the question of the tax yeah, right. specifically. But, but it, it, it provides some insight. But I'm, I'm going to ask us right to really hold ourselves accountable to something. Right, because if we don't, then we're gonna keep doing business as usual, and that's just what it is. And I just think that if we're really going to meet the moment, then we have to hold ourselves accountable to something that is tangible, right? So I would love to know, um, Chief Dillon, if you happen to know how many people in the city of Boston in the last, in your time here, let's just yeah. start with that. You can't. Own. How many people have been displaced? Um, I I can't answer that, but um, I think we can. We do have data on over time. Uh, like we don't we don't track addresses, right? So um, we don't track that the Smiths were living on Maple Street and then that then you know five years later they moved to Randolph. But what we do have, and I will be you know be. I'll be very happy to get this to you. We do have data showing, um, and I, I'm sure you've seen the Globe cover it too, and I think it's been good coverage, with that we have, you know, that certain uh, certain groups of people, certain race, races have left Boston, and we have lower percentages. And I think that is an indication of gentrification and displacement. So I, you have to, you know, it's not exact, 
but I think we can make some pretty pretty uh, decent observations right. about it. Yeah, because half the people that I know live in Brockton. Right. I and I, I, I and, and these are parents that I organized with, you know, eight or nine years ago around education issues, yeah. and now those parents have moved to Brockton, right. and now they're organizing in Brockton. So yeah. I just think it's something for us to really be mindful of that there is a migration pattern happening here, okay. and I think that we are in some ways responsible for that because we have not, to my colleague's point here, we have not been mindful of city kids, of how we, how we build in a way that does not squeeze yeah. those who are already struggling to make their yeah. ends meet out. Can I just uh, offer two things, and it's you know no, no as you said no no um, no response is perfect, but in all of our uh, income restricted housing, we do give preference, and so does the BHA for Boston residents, and I think that. I think that's really important. We have a lot of families coming from all over the region that want to live here. We have the most affordable housing. We're building the most, but we do always give uh, priority to Boston residents. And we've been very intentional uh, in the last year, I mean, before that, but really with the ARPA money that you all approved, making larger down payments and better loan products to people that want to buy a home. Yep. And in the last year, um, and I'm doing this from memory a little bit, I think it's right around 350 Boston families, the vast majority of which are BIPOC families, have bought homes. So I think it's this, it's this kind of work that's really intentional yeah. that needs to continue and expand. Yeah, I have one more, one more question and then that's it, I promise. You promise? Absolutely, <laughs> Councilor Baker, I, I, I'm wearing that necklace. Okay. Um, I am curious, it's around the vouchers and you know, I would really want to like lean a little bit more into the incomes. For example, 60% of AMI is 89% for a family of four, right? That's kind of, um, and a two bedroom apartment at 60, AMI is like 1,400. If, develop, and if a developer includes units at AMI, could the city ask them to apply to the city vouchers to make that unit affordable? to a family making thirty or forty thousand dollars a year because I think at some point like we have to figure out how we get to where we need to be. And everyone has to put in their part to get us there. So is there a world in which the city can ask um, the developer to apply for, um, to the city vouchers to make that unit more affordable? Is there is there a way for that? So in this policy we are requiring that um, developers uh, it make units available for um, voucher holders to get to a lower. So that is a requirement of this proposal. I've never seen that in any other city or state, but I think it's a good start. Um, and then we have very been very intentional about lowering the AMIs uh, for the IDP program, and you know developers can do an average of 60% AMI or 50% AMI for renters. Uh, and I, as I mentioned earlier, like if if a developer chooses a and to be have an average of 50% AMI, we're going to see a range of of, um, of incomes and associated rents 40, 50, 60. So I think with these changes, we are going to see the IDP policy serve a a range of uh, incomes, a range of family types. And uh, it, it's, they're going to be lower, and they're going to be lower rents and lower sales prices. So I'm going to be. I'm going to keep my promise and just thank you for your time. Thank you, Council Baker. Thank you. And, and just quick, Shayla, would someone leaving um, a rental property and being able to get enough together to to buy in Brockton? I think that that would be a success, regardless of where they yeah. end up. So. I think this. I think if a family wants, um, for whatever reason, they, 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 they want to move to Randolph or Brockton, then their family's there, there's a larger backyard, whatever it is, good for them. Um, but any family that's leaving Boston because they couldn't find an affordable home here, in my opinion, it's not okay. Now, is that when we use the term displaced? I is would, that what I mean by displaced? Because there's a I lot would. of people moving around. Sure. So if, if, if you're... To place, displace meaning maybe not of your actions. Of something course, like right. That. You wanted to stay here and you weren't able to because you couldn't afford to buy or rent, you know, a home that suited you or your family. I think that's displacement. Okay. Okay. And I'm just going to do a couple 
quick comments and you guys can go and I'll do the public testimony. Um, so cost of material has gone up, interest rates have doubled, IDP we're talking about here looking at potentially doubling with the 10 units coming down, which would be my big problem with this going down to seven units. I think if we were increasing the percentages but we kept it at 10 units, I would feel much more comfortable about it. So that's nearly doubled. Linkage, linkage went from, linkage went from 100,000 square feet to 50,000 square feet, went from 1539 to 2309. That's another, another doubling. Mitigation we don't know. Um, Transfer tax, rent control, commercial vacancies, it's all going up. Is this the time to, 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 to pile on maybe what I say? And I think the, the people that get hurt here are, are that small developer that in my view is in a lot of these neighborhoods that, that, that can create this housing. And the one question I have is we, there was, people were being critical about um, landlords and developers not taking this, this, the Section 8s, but that's also in a brand new building and, and the city's going to come in and say, well, you, you have to take this person right here. Is there ability to, in those IDP units, to allow, to allow the developer or people in the area, like a, like a you know, dot block, they had 35 units. The units that are in the IDPs can can we not do a lottery on those? Can the developer or someone say, yes, I have a family that's in need, that's on Savin Hill Lab, that would love to get into this. I mean, that's how we fill the units quicker. That's how we make the people that are actually building these feel, feel better about where their money is. It isn't the city coming in saying, here you go, you gotta, you gotta put this person in here. I mean, in the restaurant industry, do we tell you know, you need to use main potatoes. Only main potatoes, otherwise we're not gonna give you anything. It, it seems kinda a little different to me that this, this industry is one, now here it is, I just went through the list of everything that's going to be or already happening to them. Transfer tax being the latest one. Um, what is what is the incentive for the for that small developer where they're all on their horses and they're getting out of here now? I can tell you that right now. What's the incentive to keep those people here? Let them rent their own units, their IDP units, if there's four of them, because I've heard stories of, of the IDP units laying vacant for two plus three years. You say that's not happening now. I hope it's not happening. So why can't that person just identify someone that, that checks all the boxes, the right income, the right, the right AMI, all that? Why couldn't we do that? You don't need to answer that, but we should be looking at how we do that. We should be looking at uh, direct designation. And we should also be looking at, talk about, give something to, the, to this, this business that makes us roll. It still takes four or five years to get projects done. Dot block was eight years, 400 units. Eight years before they put a shovel in the ground. From the time we had the first meeting till, you wanna talk about cutting costs? Cut that carrying cost from eight years to three years. So those are my comments. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let, and nobody needs to answer any of that. I'll, I'll, I'll harass you all in my own time. Um, I'm gonna go to public testimony now. Brian, looks like McCarthy. For the next what? Oh, jeez. Yeah, okay. And Danny Stanton, are you here for the next? He wanted to know if he could do it over the phone. Danny had to step out to another meeting, but he wanted to. Can he, can he Zoom? Have him? Ha I got four Zooms going on here, so if he Zooms one, I'll let him do it. All right. Do you have the, the first Zoom? Thank you, everybody, for sitting through this. It went about an hour and a half longer than I thought it was going to. Hey, George, how are you? We're going to Zoom. I don't think you'd be able to do Zoom, so let's go on. Okay. All right. Sorry, Cliff. No, no worries. It, it would be difficult trying to do the phone. It's okay. Yeah. Can you just state your name and you have about two minutes?
Oh, sorry. What it, you were talking to me, uh, Counselor? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't. Uh, I did not realize we're doing the Zoom testimony right now. Okay, cool. So my name is Armani White. Happy to uh, be here uh, today as a member of the Coalition for Truly Affordable Housing, and we're uh, you know really excited and um, full of admiration for this change that's coming, and we've been a major part of making it happen. Um, these changes to the inclusionary development policy. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to see it incorporated uh, into the zoning code. It marks like a really significant milestone demonstrating a commitment from the administration to see, you know, affordable housing be created. Um, and so we feel like the amendments being proposed are necessary and essential, and they, you know, reflect a deep understanding of the issues. Uh, the decision to lower the compliance, you know, from 10 to 7, that's a good thing. And, um, you know, we agree that we got to make sure that the, the bad actors don't get around that still. And, you know, the goal to increase uh, from 13 to 20, you know, with the 3% vouchers, that's a good move and a very creative way to reach folks who are in need um, and ensure that we're, you know, we're, we're committed to fair housing. And, you know, getting close to around 60% area median income is something that is a step in the right direction. And, um, you know, making sure that we, uh, you know, are also doing more to, to ensure that the, the marketing and the tenant uh, selection plans are uh, better and that there's improved outreach and a streamlined application process and increased transparency. All these things are really good um, and things that we as a coalition have been advocating for. So really, really good to see it happening. Um, and we want to continue to, to, you know, work as advocates. Um, you know, we've heard councils mention the advocates, the advocates, you know, you know, the coalition for truly affordable Boston is the coalition that has been working with the, uh, you know, a host of counselors and with the administration to make sure that we have the strongest policy to make sure you know, Boston's truly affordable. Um, and so with that being said, you know, while we celebrate this change and we want to see it uh, approved and, and we want to see uh, like approved and improved, uh, we hope that in the future, you know, we can <clears throat> ensure all developers, you know, are really pushed to apply for the city vouchers that we've heard discussed so that they can uh, reach the most vulnerable uh, folks and create, you know, more of this housing stock. And um, that the administration, you know, you know, really, I think setting this goal of in, in a phase and requirement to at least 25% over time is something the coalition uh, sees as both like feasible and, and the right thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we're hopeful that in the future we can make the, the you know, the AMI uh, lower and to reflect more of the median income of Boston residents and that we can work to include, um, you know, a lower AMI option also for the ownership units as, as discussed in require permanent affordability and increase the percentage of affordable units over time. Um, but with that, you know, although those things are things we hope to see in the future, we're excited to see what's happening um, right now. And, and, you know, it was really good discussion today from folks, uh, at, from counselors who, you know, see the need for more affordable housing in our city and um, are concerned about uh, the well-being of our most vulnerable people. Um, and so, yeah, we advocate for the continuous evolution and enhancement of this policy and, and are proud to just be partners and want to continue to work on it. Um, so thank you for your hard work um, on this and for the counselors that have been involved that have supported the, the, the coalition. And we're gonna continue to push um, to see this improved in the future. Um, so thank you for your time and for allowing me to uh, testify virtually. Uh, thank you, thank for, you for your participation. Next person. Markeisha, can we see your face? Um, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Over. Hi, I just want to thank everybody for being here and listening. Um, I want to, um, I want to encourage the counselors to vote you know, pass, vote on the mayor's proposal. Um, but I also want to make sure that it is strong where it needs to be. Um, and I wanted to, I, I want to make sure that people understand that if developers use city vouchers, it doesn't cost them more to build or more to do anything. If they're already building these IDP units, they can use city vouchers and it will bring down the 
AMI so that folks at lower AMIs can be able to afford to stay there. Because I, while I appreciate that someone at 70% AMI or 80% AMI has to be subsidized, which I think is ridiculous in the city of Boston, um, because that should not be, that's a, that's a lot of money someone's making, then I think we can appreciate that if they have to be subsidized at that level, then they have to be subsidized truly at 30% because there's no way, there's no way that those people can afford to be here. Um, Boston is the fifth most expensive city in the United States right now. So it's not one of the least expensive. It's the fifth most expensive city in the United States. And Massachusetts is the third most expensive state in the United States. Um, and we're not advocating for just, you know, um, put your buildings, you know, developers for just poor folks, just poor folks. We want to stay. It should be across the. It should be across the board. Like there should not be exclusions, which is what is happening right now. It's let's exclude these people because we don't want these folks in the city of Boston. I don't think that that. I think that we need to make um, a stronger, a stronger proposal. I think it needs to focus on people so that we are here being able to be here to have opportunities for our kids or for ourselves or to be able to take advantage if you can't afford to live here then you you can't afford to work here because now you have to travel you can't afford to take advantage of opportunities that are in the city of boston you can't afford schooling you can't afford all of those things the, that is a uh uh a weight that is a weight on people that they live with every day. Every day, just all the stresses that we have to live through every day that I don't think a lot of you understand. So making sure that we have the least things for people, which is housing, housing um, is very important. So I just wanna finish there. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Makisha. Thank you for your participation. Who's next one? George, you're up. Can we see your face? Hi, how are you, how are you all doing? My name is George Lee. Uh, my internet Can we see your face, George? My internet connection is pretty spotty, so that's why I'm off video today. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for holding this hearing and want to appreciate the change that uh, Mayor Wu is proposing, um, including responding to community feedback to start to lower the AMIs, including the option to do rentals at 50% AMI. Um, we want it to be lower, but that's a uh, move in the right direction. And as well as including um, during the study, not just looking at feasibility, but doing a pretty comprehensive study on what the community need is, um, which really highlighted the where the most burden is in terms of displacement and housing costs. And for example, showing that BIPOC renters make um, less than 40,000, 35,000 a year. Um, and that's, that's who we need to be building more for because that's who's getting pushed out the city the most. Um, so the, the changes are a good first step, and we, I, as a coalition, um, hope that those changes pass. And at the same time, we think there could be more that the city is doing parallel to the changes. Um, one is in terms of lowering AMIs, as Marquisha just said, um, city vouchers don't cost developers money. We think probably developers, according to our, to our um, the consultant we who did analysis for us, that developers could go down to 40% AMI um, and it wouldn't cost them that much and would still be feasible. But even if you didn't want to touch the developer's money, if they applied for city vouchers, it would bring the rents down for, for the families most in need. And just to respond to Chief Dillon, you pointed out that 3% is set aside for, section, for voucher holders, but those have to be folks who already have vouchers and the waiting lists for vouchers are very long. You also pointed out that at a 50% AMI, um, 
average that you would have some 40s and some 50s and some 60s, but you're not reaching the people who would make 30% AMI. 50% uh, AMI is $74,000 for a family of four. So really we need to the city to push developers, and for example, including Dorchester Bay City, which I know Chief Jemison talked about, um, to apply for more vouchers to get more than just 3% uh, at those lower AMIs. And thank you to Councilors Fernandez, Anderson, and Mejia for asking a lot of questions around vouchers or how to bring the um, rents down. And then in terms of phasing in to at least 25%, we originally wanted 33%, um, but you know, at a minimum 25%, um, you know, Councilor Braden talked about developers flipping properties for tens of millions of dollars. Councilor Coletta said 20% should be at a minimum, and developers are, are doing more. Councilor Louis Jen talked really, um, uh, pointed out some really important information about how if you set a higher goal, it'll help mitigate the rises in land values. So we, we think that the developers could actually do 25% now, but at a minimum, again, being able to phase it in over time. And Chief Dillon had, had written us um, that RKG has shared with the Technical Advisory Committee, um, I'm just quoting a, a, an email she sent, setting incremental changes over time is the most productive way to increase affordability while minimizing the shocks to the marketplace. Such changes will be incremental, such as 1% increase per year. You know, so both RKG and the consultant that uh, Rick Jacobus that did a, an alternative analysis both thought you could increase it over time. So encouraging both to pass this um, zoning change, but for the city to keep pushing developers and in, in upcoming projects on using city vouchers and to set a goal for at least 25% and phasing that in over time. Thank you. Thank you, George. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Uh, I will. Nobody wants a closing statement, hopefully. Thank you. Um, <laughs> as a chair of the Committee of Planning, Development, and Transportation, I will be reporting favorably on this matter at the next scheduled session of the Boston City Council, <clears throat> which is tomorrow, Wednesday, September 27th. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you for, people, for the public testimony. And we had good participation from the City Council today. Um, and I thought it was a good discussion. Thank you, everybody. This meeting is adjourned.